Hello everybody, James here, WSI, and my next guest, he's wrestled pretty much every territory you care to mention, but he's more famous as being a trainer to the superstars and megastars of WWE and beyond. He is, of course, Rip Rogers. Good morning. Hey, this is the greatest day of my life. I'm alive and I'm on your show. It don't get any better than that, does it? Yeah, no, I mean, being on my show. Hey, I got, thing, one que I got one question for you, James. Hit me. Do you, see, you, need, you need, have you just subscribed to my YouTube my YouTube show. What is your YouTube wrestling channel? With, wrestling with Rip Rogers. You need to subscribe to that. Yeah. Uh, and how? That's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. I'm sitting here. I watch everything you have on your show. And you say, oh, I haven't subscribed to yours yet. Oh, okay. Well, let's get it done. I'll, I'll subscribe to it. Do you want me to do like all a, right. do, you want, do you want me to do like a screen where like I record me subscribing and everything? Or Yeah, I do. I want that. Okay. I will prepare that for you for the end of the show. Um, okay. So tell me again what the channel was called. Wrestling with Rip Rogers. That's it. Okay. And what do you have on there? Is it a straight podcast? Do you have guests? I know you have guests. Oh, we have all kinds of guests. A lot, most of the guys that I, most of the guys that I train were on there. Give us some names. I know you have Brad Maddox recently. I, I was looking through the videos, and half of them is about sex addiction. Well, that was Brad. That was he, no. We had so many shows with him. He was on a roll, baby. He was on a roll, <laughs> baby, and and it didn't it didn't get any better than that. So he had some great stories. We might as well listen to him. Mm, absolutely. Uh, who was your best guest? You think so far? Uh, I I don't know. No, they all they were all good in 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 uh, in a, in a certain way. Some of them had great stories. Some of them just had so much personality. Some of them you had to hit them in the head to get it out of them. So, uh, uh, what what Penny? about girls? Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we had Mickey James on here. Uh, God, I had a lot of girls on here. I don't have my list with me right now, and I and I'm half senile, so I can't remember nothing anyway. <laughs> you'll ask me something, and I can't remember. Oh, don't worry. Or I'll tell you. Then you'll ask it again, and I said, "Oh, okay, maybe I did remember mm -hmm. it, at least for a while." So, uh, so Kenny Boland wasn't your favorite guest then? No, we had a lot of them that, that wasn't my famous <laughs> guest, but, 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 but that's up. See, there's, there's certain things you don't do on there. You don't say, oh, uh, uh, like somebody said, oh, Cornette didn't like that guy, Di or uh, uh, Danny Davis didn't like that guy. No, you don't do that. Uh-uh. <laughs> that's, just, that's just cheap shit. Yeah, absolutely. We are uh, going to go through, as long as we're uh, recording and uh, as much as I can get through the script here, we've got a lot of fan questions. It's going to be the majority of fan questions. Some well, of my own questions as well. We got we got over 100 questions in for you. So oh, let's do it, baby. And then uh, a few of my own, and then a couple of games as well. So why don't we crack on? And I'm going okay. to ask you the first one. And I said there was a load of fan questions, but I'm going to ask one of mine first. So okay. I, was, I was looking at your history. Um, what year did you break in? Was it 78? No, no, seven, uh, no, 78, I... I'd already been working for uh, uh, Dick the Bruiser, the Sheik, Nick Goulas. And in uh, 78, I went to the Maritimes for the first time to work full time in the summer of 78. Uh, that's where I uh, met Randy Savage, uh, his brother, his dad, uh, the Maritimes, which is Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Emile Dupre was there. Uh, and that's where I, for, I, I, as a matter of fact, I went there four different summers. I went there in the summer of 88. Not 88, nine, 90, see, yeah, 88, 90, 92, and 97. When I was there in 97, I met uh, Edge and Christian, <laughs> and they were just starting out. Did you do any of the death tours, you know, the Tony Candelo death tours right into No, I, I always wanted to do them because that's what the guys always talked about in Calgary. See, mm. in like in Canada alone, I worked for, for Dupre for four summers and I, w I went uh, for Stu Hart for two stints. Then when I was in uh, uh, Portland, I went up and work. We work, go up and work Vancouver. And at the time, Vancouver was on uh, TSN, was like the super station of Canada. And then Stu Hart was on it later. So I had uh, major exposure in Canada. Yeah, I seem to remember at one point, did Stu buy into vancouver at some point i uh, my... I, I know uh, i know at one time they were making the long trip to vancouver yeah was that when they had the plane back and forth but that might be in the 50s or something i think uh, i think plane. no i remember Stan, sam minnicker stole Stu's plane and drove it down to texas <laughs> and whatever and then went back to work for him so what the hell right 
Hey, there's no, there's no firm enemies in wrestling. If you can make, if you can make, oh money, no, go back. if you could make money, if you hate me more than anybody in the world, and we can make money, great. Let's make the money. And most of the stuff, I'm mad at you're mad, and we're just both stupid because <laughs> life, life is short. Have a good time, laugh as much as you can. That's the spirit. And when you're in the, when when we're in the wrestling business, we're all missing a card. <laughs> Something's wrong with us. Excuse me. See, I was a high school football coach or a, high, or a high school teacher and a football coach, but all I wanted to do was be a championship wrestler. But anyway, I interrupted you, whatever your original question oh, was. I can't no, remember please, anyway. No, please don't. I didn't even ask it. I didn't even ask it, but uh, it was a great answer. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll ask the first one. Uh, you said, you know, have fun, have a good laugh. Yes. You can't have been laughing too much when Nick Goulas was giving you the checks. Oh, no. It's like he goes, Disky? Well, that's when I when I had the great idea of being the disco kid. Yes. So I'd come, so I'd come out like rock, rock and roll Buck Zumos, Zoom off and have a big uh, one of them been boom, boom boxers, right? And I'd dance for about three seconds, you know, and go to the ring. And I had a uh, basic black Afro with all my Carl and Hildegard stuff. And then when Randy come back in from the Maritimes, uh, uh, we became tag team partners. So I worked with Dutch a lot and the Mexican angel and then Dutch would try and eat everybody up all the time. He was, uh, and then, and I just laugh and Randy said, no, we just tag in and out. So after about five minutes of Dutch being in there, he's going, <laughs> <laughs> Randy goes out. Oh, we got it now. <laughs> Any more Dutch so there's stories? No, there's, there's, oh, I got a whole, I got a whole bunch. Oh, of I, I, always I, love no, story. I, I, I love working with Dutch. Mm. I remember one time, I remember uh, we was working for WCW and it was me and Dutch against Sting and Luger and Dutch went right out and went into it. He took a monkey flip and his back went out and he couldn't hardly move. So I had to stay in the ring the rest of the time and we had to pull some time and hell, I, here I am. I'm standing toe to toe with Sting and Luger, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a hell of a rib. I got to finish in. So what the hell, right? <laughs> Did he use that as an excuse not to drive? Or did he have an excuse never to drive? Because I don't think he's ever nah, driven anywhere. I don't think. I think Dutch probably went by himself a lot. Yeah. With well, you can't get you can't get in trouble. See, I wasn't a drinker. I wasn't a smoker or any of that stuff. All not, I did was train all the time. I was going to say and not I a midnight toker. No, and I couldn't wait to get in the dressing room because then I'd do how many squats, how many lunges, uh, stretching. Uh, calf raises, knee pull ins. That was just a place for me to work out. I loved it. It's going in that, going in there an hour early and everything. With um, I remember when I was, I remember when I was going to Japan. I was, do, I was doing squats and lunges. They started playing my music, and I started walking out the door doing lunges, <laughs> and then just freaked everybody out. And I, I just blow them Japan, uh, the the, uh, the Japanese wrestlers up. All the young boys that thought they were in shape. Huh. It was a rib to me. <laughs> Do you, I know um, you did your bodybuilding at times and some competitions. Did you ever do any like competition weightlifting? And if so, do you have any totals you can share with us? You know, bench press, oh, squats, no, that kind of no, thing. No, no, I started lifting weights when I was 14 years old because I was a fat little kid. Now I'm in Seymour, Indiana, where I get, I, I get a wooden bench and a 165 pound weight set from Sears. And I started copying all the, uh, but I did get the Weeder magazines, the Bob Hoffman magazines, the Dan Lurie magazines. They used to have a whole lot of magazines. And I'd be copying what the, the stars did. So I'm copying Larry Scott and Sergio Oliva and Dave Draper and all these guys that are dead now. They were in the first Mr. Olympia. So I'm copying with them. I was never in a gym until I went to college. So, uh, But in the meantime, when I was 18 years old, I had an 18-inch arm all of a sudden. I was just a nut. It's just like now I've, I already trained three hours today. I was up at 5 a.m. training three hours and I'm going to go back again tonight. So, and I got, now listen to this. When, when guys, when, when guys are on the, when guys are on the gas to me, they don't count. That ain't them. Hmm. So, and it, yeah, that stuff works, but I got in 12 contests in about 18 months, clean one, two, and was wrestling every day up until the last couple of days before that. Hmm. So I was just, and I did every body part every day and still do. When did I, I'm not, in, I'm not in it to get strong. 
but I get, I, I gotta have the endorphins pump. I gotta have that. I gotta have that, that high, like the runner's high, right. Yeah. Or not. I'm the most meanest bastard there is. <laughs> I'm horrible, but just let me work out and I'm fine. You, so around the mid seventies, you're breaking into the business. When did steroids really become prevalent or did they ever become prevalent in the territories? Most of the guys I knew, they were on them. And uh, uh, they was getting the, the shots in the butt. Most of them was on Diana Ball. Then they would go up to uh, the one that they did see. Diana Ball was in the mouth. And then you could take, uh, uh, then they get the shot in the butt with whatever. Uh, but uh, that wasn't me. Mm. But they worked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because we, uh, I mentioned Nick Goulas, I've got to ask about George. Is he? Everyone says he's the worst wrestler of all time. Uh, any George Goulas stories? Well, you'll like this one. Cool. George fancied himself a basketball player, but I'm from Indiana, with from the largest high school gym in the world. So all I ever wanted to do in life before being a wrestler was be a basketball player. So Georgie. He would have the body slammers. So they'd feed George the ball. And I remember then they would have the, if like they was in a high school, then when the game was over, like the game, let's say the game was three to five. And then they'd put the ring in after that. But George was so mad they got beat that he took, uh, he took his ring and went home. <laughs> I remember George would, would, uh, chop guys and he'd get mad because he'd say daddy they're hurting my hand <laughs> <laughs> and uh he was always nice to me but he's the epitome of what you should not be in pro wrestling mm. he was about six five. Oh, uh, that sweetheart bobby eaton had to be tag team partners with george um, i remember bobby was going to go to atlanta and all of a sudden his car was broken into and all of his bags and everything were stolen. So Bobby had to stay at Nashville. <laughs> so oh, whatever happened, I don't know. You can read between the lines. I just shook my head. Yeah. It's, with, with George, you look at him and you think, well, he's got the height. Shh, he's, he's about 6'5". Yeah, but he's never been in a gym in his life. I mean, why couldn't you just like hit that pigeon chest with a couple of beds? You know, he could have developed at least a bit of a body at least. But if, if your dad owns the business, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And then I think he was was too lazy to uh, to work out because in a wrestling business you can have the world's sh excuse me shittiest body, no. and all of a sudden, and if you're in your twenties, if you just eat right and don't even work out, you look great. So now, if you eat right, well, look at uh, uh what's the guy in AEW F or uh, JFK or whatever the name MJF. is. Got the three. MJF. Yeah, MJF. Yeah, MJF. He looks like a million bucks now. And all he's doing is eating right and training. Well, of course, uh, of course, uh, working for them, they got a lot of time off. I'd be, I'd be doing, uh, I'd be working out three times a day, eating like, eating like a, like a bastard. Yeah, you'd be like Hell Brock yeah. Lesnar. <laughs> oh, well, Brock, he's a freak, man. Mm. Uh, we, we'll probably we'll probably end up uh, bringing up Brock uh, later. I want to ask because this is like the dying days of um, of the Tennessee territory. What were the crowds okay. like around seventy eight? For where? Uh, Goulas territory. Oh, uh, see, I, years ago they were great, but now all of a sudden Birmingham still good, did still good, Nashville still did good, and Chattanooga did good, but uh. uh you got to remember, Jarrett took his Lexington, Jarrett took his Louisville, Jarrett took his Evansville, Jarrett took his Memphis, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Tojo and uh, Gypsy Joe stayed with, with Nick. A lot of guys were loyal to Nick. Nick treated me. It's like he said, Disco, I'd like to pay you what, but what you're worth, but I got to pay you something. And I just <laughs> laughed. And I said, you're right, Nick. I'm the shits. I'm horrible. But someday I'll be good and you help me get there. As long as I can break even here, that's all I want to do. Break even because I'm going to get a little bit better. I'm going to meet all these veterans and they would take me under their wing because I was, I didn't go to a wrestling school. So, and now I'm, I'm teacher, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good rib, but they'd take me under their wing because they knew I was doing the best I could. 
and just to help me out. Like if I was married to you in the ring all week, we would, uh, we'd practice a sunset flip and a backslide. The next week we would do something else. And pretty soon then I'm learning how to, I'm learning how to be a baby face and I'm learning how to be a heel. And I'm just shutting up and loving every minute of it. For a while, I was sleeping outside Randy Savage. He was living with his girlfriend. And I was living outside of his, his room his, uh, where he lived on the floor with a blanket. <laughs> and the heat would come underneath it. I didn't have any money. And, uh, and me and Randy would go into like a steak, steak place. And we'd eat the scraps, actually eat the scraps off the table. Now, I never ate... No, I, I think Dutch said, I, I never did the, the, the ketchup thing with the hot water in my life. Oh, that, that was a rumor, the ketchup and soup kind of affair. Yeah, never, never in my life. Now, a lot of people say, did you do that? And I said, yeah. Did you do that? I said, yeah. Did you do that? I said, oh, no, hell no. Don't credit me for that one. If I didn't do it, I'm not going to take credit for it. But if I did it, <laughs> hell yeah, I did it. I had to. I wasn't that yeah. smart. And I, needed, I, needed, I needed survival skills. With um, with the I'll get off the ghoulish territory in a second, but like an average week's pay there. Oh my God! See, Randy got me booked in there after the Maritimes. See, mm -hmm. so I I come in on a I'm supposed to be a three hundred dollar a week guarantee. So the first week was two seventy. The next week was like two thirty or two forty. Then it was about one eighty five. <laughs> but then Randy's girlfriend, uh, she left. Randy threw her out. So uh. To make a long story short, I was living with him. So we was, I had enough money to get by and I made every trip with him. So I'm in, uh, so I'm in his van all the time, just listening to him shutting up. Cause I don't know anything. And here he is a second generation wrestler raised in the business. The guy who was so intense, he taught me about intensity and he's ready to fight anybody for no reason. And me, I'm the most do doop do doop do doop. <laughs> I've never been in a real fight in my life. I was a great athlete, but not, not like Randy. Hell, Randy played. He played minor league baseball in the rookie league. He tied for home runs with Eddie Murray, Hall of Famer Eddie Murray, who had over 500 home runs and 3,000 hits. But the leader, that, but the, but tied with, with Randy Randy Poffo, right? And when they cut him, they said, "Oh, we won the left hand first baseman." So you know what you know what the you know what he did over the the, the summer or the or the winter yeah. he learned to throw left handed, and we and later on we would play catch sometimes and he could still throw left handed. He couldn't. They said, "Oh well, we want somebody who could do that snap underneath throw for the uh, for for the, the the three four three double play." Mm -hmm. And if you're a baseball fan, you know what that is. But yeah, but he could still zip that ball. But it, it looked awkward, but he could still do it. That's what a nut he was. Throwing the ball 1,500 times a day up against a wall to show that, basically to show those bastards. Yeah. It, then you get cut anyway. There's nothing like so motivation he, like revenge. Yes. Yeah. So then he took his baseball bats and he destroyed them all, hit them against a tree and everything. Just another day in the life of the Macho Man. <laughs> what did and he, he got the name? He got the nickname Macho Man when he was playing minor league baseball. Because hmm. anytime there was a fight, he was the first one out. <laughs> and, I, and we lived together four years. So we're sitting there, or almost everything in the wrestling business I learned from his family, and I learned a whole lot from Buddy Rose. Because me and Buddy Rose were tag partners in Portland, but uh, Randy, I never seen him back down from anybody. He'd re be ready to fight you for no reason. He'd rib the shit out of me, and it oh he'd be like a little kid, and in uh, I'd rib him about something, or he'd lock the door. If I locked the door, he'd just knock the door down. If you go in our apartment, all the walls are punched out, and my hands are still good. I didn't hit the walls. <laughs> But he would, but I think he'd give you the shirt off his back. And uh, God, we had some good times. We took that ICW territory and we got up to 13 TV markets. Hmm. And we were running two shows and two shows. And I remember one Saturday, we even had three shows. Usually the, his dad would run a show. I'd run a show. And maybe Garvin would run a show. Because we were in opposition to Ron Fuller, to Jim Barnett to the Sheik, to Dick the Bruiser, to Bob Geigel, Jerry Jarrett, all these pro promoters. We were against them all. 
So, and, and Randy was such a nut, uh, in a good way. He would treat a spot show like Madison square garden. Every night was Madison square garden. He did not give a shit. He'd be gaffing. We'd potato the shit. I remember me and me and Lanny had, had the hair match in uh Rupp Arena in Lexington and I hard weighed his eyes and head button him in the eyes. So his eyes was like swollen, swelling shut. And he said, Oh, that's enough. Cause we wanted to show how we were marks. We wanted to show everybody how tough we was. Right. Mm. And then all of a sudden he's, we're walking around. I said, well, we'd all go to the, the same gym, gym at different times. Right. And, and we're sitting there and then I was in physique contest. Randy was in physique contest. Lanny was in physique contest. Pistol Pez Watley was Kentucky state powerlifting champion. Mike Dogendorf was a super heavyweight. He was, he was the same thing. And we just had such a good time. We were all young, all stupid. And just living, living the life, living the dream and having the time of her life. And it wasn't about the money. Wrestling was never about the money with me. That's how stupid I am. <laughs> but I'm going to, I come in broke and I'm going to die broke. So what the hell? Yeah. As long as you've had a good time. Yeah. I mean, if you I come get in on a roll. Son- you come in with nothing, you leave with nothing. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference. And then sometimes I, like I, Randy would give me all of his, I called him the go to hell headbands. All these old robes he'd give to me. And then, uh, it was just, it was, it was like a movie e- every day. We was just every day in the wrestling business. Every day is a holiday with getting up, getting up, eating good, go to the gym, ribbon, driving, talking all the stories, doing, he's doing the booking in the, in the cars, doing the finishes. <laughs> One time I said, all of a sudden we ran out of gas. We're driving his car. I says, you ran out of gas, you dumbass. He goes, why didn't you tell me? How can I tell you when I'm looking over? Wait a minute, you're driving. <laughs> the gas thing. <laughs> Instead of saying, oh, I was so involved in my booking and the stories we're telling that I didn't even think about it. And I said, if I look over here, it looks like it's three quarters of a tank. Because I'm over here at looking at an angle. But it was my fault. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then we used to, he was the most competitive person. We had to run a 40 yard dash. Of course, if I beat him, he'd tackle me. Then we would have a, a curling contest. So I remember we had one in, in the house. It'd be me and Randy living together. And then, then Pistol Pez Watley would come in. Of course, of course, my phone's got to ring. Who, who knew that wasn't going to happen? <laughs> it always does. Uh, pa- so power we're having through a it. Power cur- through it. Yeah, we're ha- we're having a, a curling contest w- with dumbbells. So, so we, we got two 40-pound dumbbells. So I do 50 in a row. So then Pez is up. Pez does uh Pez does 51. So Ran- all Randy's got to do is get 52, right? So he gets 52. Uh, I'm the champion. Oh no, that was the first round. I just wanted to see what you could do. So I did 104. <laughs> so I doubled it. <laughs> so all of a sudden. Contest over. <laughs> <laughs> and Pez, you, Pez would get mad. He says, you ain't figured it out. Pez would go, Pez could, could did Pez could do 405 for four on the incline. But when him and Randy would have it, but when he, him and Randy would uh, see, uh-oh, I lost. Hey, hey, Clint, something's. Pausing. Right, so you were at um, 405 on the incline with Pez. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, so, so Pez was ha- having a bench press contest with Randy. So they got to 400 and Randy got it and Pez couldn't get it. Like what you did. I said, wait, well, he, he said, I said, yeah, don't you get it? You got to let him win. Then he's happy. So all of a sudden Randy's giving Pez free joints and everything. He's offering me a Coke and everything. Right. <laughs> and I was never smart enough. I was just a dumbass. I, <laughs> he was, and I never could get that. I said, I can't do that. Oh, I said, well, uh, I got the free joints and, and then I'm always in the, I'm always in the shithole because he's mad at me because I beat him at something. <laughs> I was going to say, you get real. tackled and he gets the free oh, joints. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh. With, uh, you know, let's talk more about Savage because no one can ever get enough okay. stories about Savage. Did he hey. always have the voice or did, that, or was that just, did it get deeper and more gruffer as time went on? Okay. It's like, put it this way. When so, this is before cell phones, et cetera, when somebody would be on the phone, 
whoever called up, he would go, oh, <laughs> right away, you're backpedaling, right? And, and he'd give me the wink. So I, so then later on, when I was on the road, I'd answer the phone, oh, and then somebody <laughs> say, fuck you, asshole, or something. That's <laughs> all what I was just, I was just doing Randy. That wasn't really me. What do you need? You know, <laughs> you know uh, this is going to be the first of a few times I'm going to bring up Dutch, but Dutch said the story where you and Savage were having a battle for some reason. I'm sure you're going to tell me in a second. The punchline mm-hmm. was, is that I found out two things. Uh, I can't really fight, but neither can Savage. Is that true or is that uh, entirely not? I don't I don't know about... Uh, in something like that, you know how stuff happens and it probably takes 45 seconds, mm. but you can tell a 20-minute story about it. And what really happens, you, you'd have to be an outsider looking in or you'd have to have a phone right there to really look at it, what happened. Because, uh, well, that's like Dutch was telling a story about, there was t- three times they told about a story about me and Randy in the Waffle House when Randy got in a fight. But then again, it was it, that was a thing on the territories. But that wasn't even in Jared's territory. It was in Nick Goulas' territory five years before that. And then all of a sudden I wasn't there, but I'd been on on there three times before that I was there. So everybody tells stories, but they weren't there. I was there, but but I guess I wasn't there because I'd have to hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, did you know, before we move off the Poffos entirely, you mentioned Lanny before. He's passed away very suddenly and quite recently as well. Uh, any particular memories of Lanny you'd like to bring up? He had the greatest right hand I've ever seen in my life. Really? Oh, my God, you watch him throw a punch. But just because he didn't have the push, but you can't do too many of them or they don't mean nothing. I watched Lawler hit uh, Buddy Landell 60 times, and that was the finish. But Buddy didn't have no, no marking, no swelling, no blood, no nothing. So in other words, you're just exposing the business. Mm. That's like you throw too many punches, either I, can't, either I hit like a girl or it's phony. But it's all come out that it's phony, so what the hell, right? But I always try to do to just to limit limit your punches because, I mean, when you watch UFC, right, they 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 hit th- oh three hammer fists, you're done. They're swelling. He's bleeding right there, right? So we're killing our own business by doing too much stuff. What about the 10 punches in the corner? I take it you're not a fan. As a heel, when I would do it, I'd go up there, milk it. I'd hit him one time that baby face will go all the way down. I'd let him sell the next corner. I'd pick him up, call for it, hit him one time. Not And not in the head. I hit him in the jaw, in the soft part. You would never hit nobody in the forehead. You would never hit. If you can't punch right, don't know how. If you can't do it, don't do it. Don't do it wrong. And then on the third one, I'd go for it. But then he'd get me. Do the, and pull me out to the middle and do the front ass bump, right? Mm-hmm. The front ass bump or sell on your tailbone. Sometimes a guy's selling nuts, but it's supposed to be, it, it, that should be a, a DQ, but that's one of them unwritten rules in wrestling. You know, yeah. that's like, oh, if we're fighting on the floor and I throw you in the ring. Well, the, cl- uh, the count stops for you, but for me, it should still be going. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know how we don't have, you know how rules are in wrestling. It don't mean, it mean nothing anyway. They, so, uh, they they suit the story that day. I think right. the rules can be. Uh-huh. It's like the over-the-top rope rule that I always found quite weird because obviously, you know, as a younger fan, we never had, yeah. the, had that in the WWF. Uh, or I don't even think we had that in British wrestling, the over-the-top well, rule. Y- but yeah, yeah y- y- years ago, some states had a, a, a 10 count. Some had a 20 count outside. Mm-hmm. Some states, there was an over-the-top rule. Some there wasn't. So you had to you had to adjust and you had to adapt. And a lot of times, like we would be wrestling in Illinois, they would send referees down from the commission and they would have a different set of rules and stuff, but they would remind you. And they and they would tell you, you know, make sure you kick out early if it ain't finished. You know, they'd help you. Going on what you were talking about before with the best punches, who do you think is the I mean, you you've trained so many. If you yeah. had a video of one person to say you punch like this who do you Lanny show Poffo's the, be- the best it's the really? best right hand 
a lot of guys will do the old, they're hitting their show, they're hitting their self. But Lanny would do it and he would hit to stop it. He could punch you in the nose. It's, it's just missing you this much. He was so good, right in the nose, straight in and stop it right there. And I and I worked with Lanny about 300 times. So I was basically the victim that uh <laughs> <laughs> he learned how to be such a great puncher. <laughs> He's got the but best. He was, and he got it from Jeff Ports, who was Scott McGee's father. Oh, yeah. They were in, in North Carolina, and he was explaining it to Lanny. And he didn't have it yet. He didn't, he didn't quite have it down all the way right. And Lanny got it from him. So he'd be practicing in that dressing room all the time, all the time, all the time. And we get in the ring and we was in a spot show. We just do a lot of them just for him to get practice in. Because a lot of time he, oh, I thought he'd break my jaw so many times. But I probably hurt his hand too. So what the hell, right? Like, <laughs> who, who has the best punch psychology? Not the best punch, but the best use of the punch to get the most out of it. Man, I don't, I don't know. because I, I don't watch wrestling anymore. I can't stand well, it. Well, I mean, back in the old days. Well, you, you can't tell. Unless you're there, you don't know. Because there a lot of there was there wasn't cable TV. I'm growing up. All I got was Dick the Bruiser. Then I got some Nick Goulas. Then if I got the antenna out, I could get the Sheik late at night from Cincinnati and Phil Golden All Star Wrestling. Uh, Saturday night, late, 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 putting the the rabbit ears the other way. Mm. And and I wasn't smart anyway. <laughs> so that's what what's so funny is these guys. Everybody's got an opinion. It'd be like me having an opinion on politics. I don't do politics. Or let me let me uh, give you my opinion on this quarterback. Well, how in the hell would I know? All I did, I was, uh, you know, everybody's got an opinion about everything. Knocking everybody, and they're sitting there uh, watching it on TV. But they, but they know. Okay. When you're in the wrestling business, you don't know nothing. A couple, couple years in, you think you're starting to get it. You're not. Five years in, your opinion changes a little bit. By the time I'm meeting Ronnie Garvin, he'd been working 20 years. So we're taking flat backs on all this stuff. They teach you that stuff for safety. But Garvin didn't take bumps. You'd hit him. He'd go to a knee. He'd take two stagger steps back. He'd do a roll. And it was just so like, he, he said, no, this is like a choreograph. Me and him would work 50 minutes and we never say a word in the ring. Unless he would say in his French Canadian accent, double knockout. <laughs> but, but that might be it. So you learn to work from all these older guys and you just shut up and do as they're told. Because they're not there to have a, a bad match. You, If you can only do three things, they're going to do those three things because they got to work every day. And I might hurt you. And then later on, it's all the uh, the, kid, the kids wanting to get their shit in. Mm -hmm. No, I'd have an hour Broadway. I remember working Salvio Vega in uh, uh, TNT uh, in Puerto Rico. And he was just on uh, some big pay-per-view with WWE, right? Yeah, he was on Backlash, yeah. Okay, him and Carlito. Well, Carlito was a baby when I was there. He was a little kid. And I worked an hour with... Uh, with uh, uh, Juan Rivera, who was who was Savio, and he was TNT. So I said, T, well, hell, I was the boss. So I said, T, we're going an hour. He goes, what? I said, yeah, uh, start your start a slow comeback at 57. Uh, hit me with a Savat kick. Uh, put the Cobra sleeper on me. I'll pop the Alka-Seltzer, and then that'll be it. I'll see you in the ring. He goes, yeah, but, and that was it. That's all that I called everything in the ring. And he said, today I learned how to work, didn't I? I said, you sure did. And you can do it. Mm. But before there was two dressing rooms, a lot of times you didn't get the finish till you got in the ring. And you just knew, had to know how to do it. You watched the other matches and you didn't do what they did. Or you watched the other matches and something that, that, was a, that, was a, uh, that they won the pin with, you'd use that as a false finish because they'd already seen somebody win with it. Yeah. So they, they would buy it. You know, I get rambling, so you got to cut me off. Oh, sometime. don't don't you worry about it. You, it's all about a ramble and a story. This thing. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I'm going to show you the, uh, of the first of four pages of script. Okay, we've made it to here. So we've made it one quarter down the first page of the uh, of the script. So I'm finally going to ask some fan questions. Uh, there's okay, a, there's a billion of them. 
There's a billion of them. A oh, billion? That's the okay. That's a, no, that's a lot. There's a hundred. I've, I'm prone to hyperbole occasionally. So you'll have to okay. stop me when I when I do that as well. But uh, I'm going to ask this one. Frank Knoll, I would love to know Rick Rogers' thoughts on his time in Portland, Oregon area. Arguably, that was one of the heydays of the Portland area with Rip, Piper, Rick Martell, Ron, uh, Ron slash Sam Oliver Bass, Dutch Savage, Buddy Rose, and several others. Now, you said you worked with Buddy Rose as yeah, your Yeah, Buddy, tag- I, was, yeah. I, I was tag team partners when I come out there because uh, Ed Wiskowski had gotten... He had nut surgery or so. What? So Ed, so Ed was out for a while. What, like, but, like vasectomy or he had to have his balls drained or something? <laughs> Whatever it was. I didn't really inquire. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted a younger, more attractive man. Ed was a little bit older. You know, I, I wasn't into the mature males at that time. Mm-hmm. So Buddy was the – Buddy was so good. Called in the ring. He could make – they actually, for about nine years – they booked the territory around him as a heel. He was over as a heel so much they had to turn Roddy Piper babyface. And then him and Buddy had the greatest feud they ever had out there. And then yeah, Rick Martell was out there when I was there. Rotten Ron Starr, Adrian Adonis. Adrian wasn't very nice. Adrian was sort of a bully. Mm. But but Piper was out there. And then Ed come back the second time I, I was out there. And uh oh, the Bushwhackers. Yes. The Bushwhackers were there. So in every trip, it was me, Buddy, and the two Bushwhackers. There's Butch and Luke. They either got the marijuana cookies or they're smoking the Bob Hope, the dope on the on the way back. Never on the way there, but always on the way back. Mm. Me and Buddy would be in the back. We'd have the mason jars and, and I'd I'd uh and let's say I poop a looched in a mason jar. So and, <laughs> and and they'd be saying and I'd put it in back of Luke or Butch's head. I go, oh fuck my oh, oh, who fodded that? Who fodded? Who apple todded fodded? You know. <laughs> and so they're just screaming and buddy's just laughing. And every time we'd have a show, what like we go to Wendy's, Buddy always bought everybody's food. That's that's how cool Buddy Rose was, and he lived with two girls. Oh yeah, and, and uh, yeah. I when I walked in to his place, he had three dogs: Pepper, Pretzel, and Pebbles. Three, what do you call them? Dash hounds, weenie dogs, or whatever. Yeah, sausage sausage dogs. We yeah, we'd they'd almost eat you up, but he'd get on them, and then 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 they would be cool. But I walked in there, and Buddy had one of those. This is when the big VCRs were coming out. And the huge ass fucking TVs that was like a a uh, a movie screen or whatever. And Buddy had all of his matches on tape. So as soon as I went back to Lexington, I got me the VCR and I had all my stuff in tape. So I had basically everything almost since I started until I quit. Then I go to Cauliflower Alley Club. All of a sudden, my uh, sump pump don't work in my basement. Everything I had, every picture, every tape, all gone. Oh, yeah! Oh. Wow! Because I went to cauliflower. You know what I mean? So I was come that like home. all ICW, all the Poffo territory stuff? Oh, because this is so all, little this footage. Is, this is everything. Sometimes I'll have. Uh, there was one box. It was in, and we will have some old tapes in there. But I, what it is is, I forgot I had those. And they were like extra ones up in uh, uh, on the closet or whatever. That is a that is a, a lot of times we'll a lot of times we'll play some of that old like we had John Cena winning the battle royal and Vaughn Lilas beating uh, 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 John Cena stuff like stuff mm-hmm. like that. But uh, we got them and and we play them on our YouTube channel Wrestling with Rip Rogers. So subscribe everybody right now. That's everybody subscribe right That's now. That's what James says to do. Yeah, I'm telling you, do it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. But Portland was such a great. And then Piper would, he would wind you up. He was the king. Whenever he was late, he'd always come in with a, uh, he'd have something, he'd be bringing in some oily part. Oh, I tried to get here, but I broke down. I had to do this. And and he'd have, uh, he'd be ribbing Elton Owen. So he put me through the things with Elton. So was Elton. Elton would have, they'd do the one minute shoots there. Mm-hmm. You might get up to a hundred dollars versus fifty for the loser, and Elton be saying, "He go rip. You got the, you got the, uh, you got, you got the shoot with Matt Bourne. You know he's a great amateur. 
So I wanted to do string it all out, you know, where I almost beat Matt, almost beat Matt. We were always nothing, nothing. And the son bitch went out there and pretty much just ate me up and, and killed me in about 20 seconds. And Elton says, ah, I was waiting on that for nothing. Because <laughs> Matt was real green then. Did you did you get to the point where, like, because I think I've heard this story or a version of it where, like, he paid to do the shoots and then obviously the wrestlers would start realizing and then... No, we always worked. As, as, yeah. as, soon as, you, as soon as you got in there, you were immediately smartened up to the, the one-minute shoots. Yeah. Immediately. So if you were an amateur, you, you wanted to wait and wait and wait because Elton, he... He wouldn't give a shit about the matches, and he'd walk up there with a big old cigar. He'd be getting right up there by the ring and almost sticking his head in there. He wanted to see it so bad. <laughs> then all of a sudden, after the one-minute shoot, he'd go, ah, shit, there wasn't no winner, right? And he'd walk off. And then the boys back up, and then they start working like this, <laughs> working with the markets of Queensberry rules or whatever. <laughs> uh, because we mentioned Buddy, uh, Playboy Buddy as well, uh -huh. and – who else to ask as far as who's got the psychology as a wrestler? Because obviously you look at him, he looked like shit. I mean, that was almost the character. He, no, you no, know, that was but, later on. He looked like yeah. shit. But um, when like, he was about to, when he was about two twenty eight to two thirty two, he he actually was beating me in the forty yard dash. Really, he could do one arm push ups even when he was really heavy. Mm. He was just a natural athlete. He was a hockey player, and he quit school. He quit school and he was a ring boy for Vern Gagne. And right. then he was going in Gagne's camps with like a uh, steamboat and all those guys. And uh, they just beat the shit out of buddy, beat the shit out of him, beat the shit out of him because Vern Gagne would have in all these high dollar real athletes, NFL guys that got cut and stuff. And then, uh, uh, Buddy couldn't take it, so he quit. Wahoo said, "What'd you do?" He says, "I quit." Then he smart. Then Wahoo smartened him up. He said, "Buddy, j I'll make sure you get another chance next year. Just, just gut it out. Just gut it out. Then they will teach you after they weed all the bad ones out." Ah. And that's what happened. And then Buddy was, and then Buddy was a natural. With Buddy, he could do car. He could do cartwheels as he was just people hated him. But when he turned babyface, they all stormed the fucking ring. Mm. All they had about a hundred people in that ring. All kids, and it was all Buddy. Buddy's one of the funniest guys you'd ever you you would ever want to meet. Yeah, I've, I've heard be. nothing but great things about Buddy. As, you know, as, as as a talent, as a person. Yeah. And um, there's there's only certain people who like I sort of equate him in my mind to Adrian Adonis when he started putting on a lot of weight in maybe the late eighties, yet could still yes. do all the same stuff. You know, the like the Ray yeah. Stevens over the uh, over the ropes, the whole bit. Ad Adrian Adonis was he could I seen my first hangman bump with Adrian Adonis really, and he could tie himself in all different ways, and he was a great worker. But I was uh, I was green compared to him, and he'd just eat me up and call stuff in the ring. And then Piper got on him. He said, "No, he needs to learn to call this." So Adrian and Adrian just did. He did. He uh, idolized Ro uh, Roddy, which we all did. Mm. So what Roddy said, that's the way it was. And then Adrian uh, wasn't as mean to me as he was because he was like a he was just sort of like a eddie haskell if you're old enough to know who he, he, he was just uh he, he was a adrian adonis was a real man and he was a tough guy too mm. but most of the wrestling business is all tough guys I, i'm not a tough guy my grandma your grandma could beat me <laughs> but i'm a good performer and i just love to perform i am gonna I'd, the... I'd rather i'd rather hurt myself than hurt you yes uh, the yes. Hippocratic Oath, first yes. do no harm. Yeah. Which I was I was like uh, to hear of that one. I, I'm going to ask this one. Uh, this uh, lady wrote in loads. I'm just going to ask one. Ellie asks, Bob Orton was tag team partners with Randy Savage right about when he had Randy Orton. Was Randy Orton right. named after Randy Savage? And yes, he was. Or, was he really? Yes, he was. Yeah. And uh, she also asks general stories about Bob Orton and uh, your time shared in ICW. Oh, well, what it was, it was uh, me and the three Poffos were the, and Ronnie, or were the owners of ICW. And then Bob Roop, Ronnie Garvin, Bob Orton Jr., and Malenko, and Ron Wright, 
they went opposition to Ron Fuller and became All Star Wrestling out of Knoxville. This is the Plan B. This is the Plan B. No, video, this is isn't this, it? this is way before. This is way before Plan B. Oh right. I, I'm thinking. I never seen that Plan B till a couple of years ago, and I and I said, wow. But did, were they ever going to do that? Hell no. That was just a bluff. They were just working. Get real, Marks. You're not going <laughs> to. You're not going to sabotage your. Which they're going to use you anyway. If you can draw money, who wouldn't use 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 those guys? Mm. But no, then so then uh, so uh, they all come in. We we was doing our t our promos at Somerset, Kentucky for a while, and John Beck was the announcer for ICW for a while when we first started. And then uh, so they all come in down there, and then they left Knoxville, and they started doing their TV in Lexington with us. So for a while, we were international all-star wrestling because it was part ICW and part all-star, but they merged. So we would have two much matches on the tape and they would have two matches on the tape. And then we'd work their towns because we were in their markets and they'd work our towns because they were in our markets. But then uh, Roop Orton Garvin and uh, Roop Orton Garvin, see Malenko, he, he went back to Knoxville. But Ronnie owned, he ended up, Ronnie had 20% of the company. And then uh, uh, Orton and Roop, they had 10%. And Randy always uh, trained with Bob Orton uh, Jr. at the, at the, at Sente Sports Center. So, and then after, after about two years, uh, hell, the boys were making more money than us. <laughs> now, because it was just, hell, we had, uh, we had got two, now, now, Angelo bankroll, I, I put my, my original money I, I put in and, uh, and then Angelo, he, he bought two ring trucks. Then he bought two diesel vans. He said, no, he just wanted to wrestle with his kids because he couldn't, they wouldn't take all three of them. They might take them in Charlotte, but they'd use this guy for two months and they couldn't stay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this way they could stay. And with us, we was going to go in, get established or whatever. And he said, okay, Rip, you go, you, you go out to Portland and stay there till, till I call you to come back. Cause I was going to go to LA just like Piper had got Lanny booked. See, Lanny got me booked in Portland hmm. and Piper was going to get me into LA just like he was going to get Lanny into LA. But that's when, uh, Randy told Lanny to come home. Yeah, now, so, now I was actually yeah. going to say that because Lanny, when I spoke to him, he was I yes. think, a bit resentful because they used the whole "we need you in the family" kind of thing. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. and I didn't want to come back because I had I was having I was having so much fun because when you're in the promotion, there's a lot of stress, hmm. and even if it's a good house or a bad house, you're just stressed the whole time. But when it's over, you can't. But since we're 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 wrestlers and we're sort of addicted to this shit, we couldn't <laughs> wait to do the next one. You know, so, uh, so ended up, uh, so Garvin ended up going to Atlanta, uh, and working for Ole and then, uh, Bob Roop and Bob Orton, they went to work for Bill Watts. So it all worked out for the best. And, uh, so I, and I'd talk to those guys later and I'll see Bob Orton. Uh, well, this is tape, so it don't matter anyway. <laughs> I'm going to see in St. Louis the, the, this weekend. You'll see him. Uh, You'll see him at yeah. some point. We know that. I, I'm going yeah, to we'll see him at some point, but, uh, that, all the stuff where you thought the promoter was uh, screwing them, there's bills. There's <laughs> bills to be paid. Yeah. And when we started promoting, they're saying, oh, we thought Fuller was screwing us, but he really wasn't. <laughs> no, you got bills to pay. You got TV bills. This is at that time you were paying for each market to be on there. Was it like an, you know, it was you, like an infomercial? Or yes, yeah. that's all you're doing. We, we was putting an infomercial on. That's right. That's a beautiful thing uh to to compare that to yeah so uh but anyway uh so so they all left etc and uh and w whatever the next question is or whatever no, you know I, I get on the roll oh don't I worry I, I'll, I'll just follow up on that briefly um icw sort of started i won't say faltering i don't know but i mean obviously the poffos just sold up around 84 and then uh, uh, Lanny and Randy end up on Memphis TV, right? Um, just before they do, and basically they did the, like the whole concession call, didn't they? Say, look, we're closing up. Let's just right. Let's just let's make some money. Exactly. Let's make some money. Yeah. You know, no one hates each other enough not to make money right. in the wrestling business. Uh -huh. um, but uh, you must have been seeing all these uh, interviews that Randy was saying about 
challenging Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee. As- yeah, which, okay, now, now here's the thing. What they were doing was stupid, but I was the low man on the totem pole. And whatever the, whatever the, the, the higher ups decide to do, I'm not going to say a word. Because I'm not, I'm in a first grade level compared to them being in the eighth grade. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It didn't seem right to me. We should be plugging our, our towns, yeah, taking it, everything we have to try and draw money. But then, but then he's saying, well, the people who see they're cowards, which I didn't agree with, but that's, that doesn't matter what I was thinking. Cause I wasn't going to express it anyway. Mm-hmm. I just did what I was told because I'm trying to learn the business, you know? And, I, and then all of a sudden, when we would have other towns to run, I was, I was entrusted with the money. I was entrusted with uh, doing all the finishes, running the show, making sure the breaks were right and everything was done the way it was supposed to be done. Absolutely. We're going to move on to another question now. Uh, oh, geez, my eyesight's shocking. Uh, Jason Lasusa, I would like to hear about Rip's time in the Global Wrestling Federation. He was part of a faction called the Cartel, who had a mysterious boss. Did they know all along uh, who the boss was going to be revealed as? Uh, um, this fellow says, I remember it being anticlimactic, but it was a good faction with Mick Foley, Scott Levy, and a future Bastion Booger. Yeah. Uh, they. It was like only booking yeah. the thing with Sting. Uh, uh, oh, the when, um, uh, Scorpion, the Black Scorpion. Yeah, the, the, the mysterious voice. Yeah. Only, just, only did it as a rib, and they just kept playing it out. Did he know what was going to be? No. Did we know who the boss was when I went there? No. Who was it eventually then? Because I don't know. I think it was Max Andrews who owned the thing. Oh, uh, <laughs> so he was I the think boss. that's what it was. <laughs> well, what happened with Global, they had some guy from, a, uh, let's just say, a, uh, somebody from Europe that made a bunch of money in the oil or, or whatever it was. And then you know, he was supposed to be some big multimillionaire backer. And then all of a sudden he didn't pan out. So they had some woman that made her money in real estate. So I remember when I was first going there, uh, Joe Pettacino called me up and says, you want to do this? I said, well, I'm doing all the Atlanta TVs. He says, well, we want to put you in this thing. And so I said, well, let me ask Jody Hamilton. So I went down cause I did all the, uh, uh, Atlanta TVs and, uh, Oli would put me on some house. He says, can you work a week with junkyard dog and get him off his butt? I said, sure I can. I can work with dog. Yeah. Cause dog made me a lot of money. I I could work underneath in Watts. It was great. I was making more there than I was making on top of other places. Just, and it was great to let your body heal up. I had my hair dark. Watch said, If you get over, I'm firing you. I said, don't worry. I'm going to be as boring as possible. I ain't going to do nothing. I'm just going to take that run as long as it's here. And thank you very much, Bill. Hell yeah. What was we going on? See, oh, see, I global. Get, I, global wrestling. Oh, yeah, yeah, global. So all of a sudden, yeah, Jody says, I don't care what you do in global, just don't knock us. I said, oh, I ain't that stupid. On So in global, I'm in the cartel, and then on uh, TBS, I'm still getting, getting my ass beat all the time, which I don't give a shit whether, you know, you want you want me to go thirty minutes? That's fine. You want one minute? Don't. It's the page the same with me. I'm hanging out with the boys, eating good, telling stories. You know, just living the Working life out. of a wrestler, Working which out. is the great, which is the greatest thing in the world. I am going to ask another question. Sunview, how did Rip get the oh, opportunity? Oh wait a minute! No, oh, now go I got to answer. Now I got to answer the rest of the question. Oh, go on. We talked about global, right? Oh yeah. So I, I would be sitting in. Now this is when they had money first at global. So I'd be sitting in my house in Seymour, Indiana. The like, if I'm leaving on a, a Wednesday, all of a sudden Wednesday morning early, they'd be sending an overnight thing for a plane ticket, and I'm going, "Well, why would they? Why wouldn't they send it earlier and shit?" Right. Mm-hmm. And then after a while, all of a sudden the money dro- dried up with them, and all of a sudden they, uh, if you couldn't drive in, they could, you couldn't be on, you couldn't be on there. Because uh, I remember I met uh, Jerry Lynn and uh, 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 X Pac. What was his name then? One uh, Two Three Kid or whatever. Yeah. Was it, was, it like the whatever. Lightning Kid or the Cannonball Kid or something like that? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Legendary Lightning Kid. Oh, was that what it was as well? Yeah, I could. Yeah, and I still call him Legendary Lightning Kid, <laughs> and he because they, they he was from uh, come in from Minneapolis, and uh, we I remember we had his 18th birthday party at Denny's. It was his birthday, <laughs> so 
so uh so that so that was fun they, they were a big deal like it maybe in like the, the like in the newsletters and stuff the jerry lynn and sean waltman matches back in the day they were causing a bit of a stir I think, well they were they? doing they were doing what i call a lot of stupid shit you know it was just getting your shit in they were having the time of their lives they'd worked with each other a long time they knew they knew each other inside and out they were having great matches and it wasn't like one guy was a physical freak you know it was you know uh with big muscles and everything it just looked like very very great competitive matches and they stood out for being different and that was great mm. that's what's wrong with wrestling we don't want 10 steak matches we want a steak match a hot dog match a court on the cob match some be a bean match we want all matches different mm. all telling stories with certain body parts and stay away from it and, and don't do too many stupid false finishes that mean nothing if you and if you sit back and go oh my god i can't believe he kicked out up yours <laughs> I'd be just sitting there and just say, just, just act like I'm spitting on the guy. Come on and fight. Just, just drop elbows on him, kick it. Come on, get up and fight. Come on, get up and fight. Instead, oh my God, I ain't putting you over. Hell no, you're winning in the end. I'm beating the shit out of you. You're getting a W. What the hell? Is this the right time to bring up the dive tweets? Because it just so encapsulated uh, the, the maybe the indie wrestler mentality i can find it and read it out if, if you'd like or i okay. mean you could probably say it no i just copied i just somebody else said it and i just agreed with it was all it was was it randy orton or did randy orton share it from you no randy randy jumped in and joined the same thing i tell you what i'm gonna pause a sec and i'm gonna quote it one sec okay i found it so i'm gonna quote it for you so what was this 2017 so it says every indie match now handshake drawn out move exchange this is awesome chance strike exchange dive no sell indie strong style dive more strikes no sells dive flippy floppy sequence dive hit everyone with each other's finishes then humpty dumpty we all fall down fight forever chance rinse and repeat until every move is useless and means nothing dive take unsafe shot that looks like shit and hurts like hell then roll up finish handshake and hug after the match everyone's hands raised all these guys chant go home and type on social media thanking your opponents and company for the match and telling others they should book these guys dot 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 dive it's, it's a it's, awesome. it is great all i did was retweet it that wasn't me i just retweeted it then randy jumped on it because dives are just so stupid now i'm not against dive i'm not against them but when there's eight of them in one match and they don't if you dive and you and you hit me, boom, throw me in and give me the finish. Because I'm I'm completely fucked up. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, no, don't worry. I... Or the guy missed the dive. Okay, <laughs> now he went down and hurt. He, he missed it and he hurt his knee. Well, good. Throw him back in the ring and put some kind of leg submission on him because he hurt his knee. I just want him to mean something. <laughs> you don't fall off the Empire State Building and get up. No, make it. All I want is make it mean something. They used to call it a high risk maneuver. Yes, and there seems to be no high risk to any of these high risk maneuvers anymore. If you miss it or hit it, there seems to be no little jeopardy and little reward for what used to be a match ending maneuver. Well, it's like, but it's like Jake the Snake's DDT. He just does it better than everybody else. Exactly. So for everybody else, they they just kick out on it. But for him, no, he ain't going to. It's like Dick the Bruiser. There wasn't no false finishes with Dick the Bruiser. He wouldn't cover you unless it was a finish. That's how smart he was. What's, and this was in the 1950s. Yeah. What's, what's something in wrestling now that you see on television? I know you don't watch wrestling as much. Uh, or right, unless, much somebody all, sends me, unless somebody sends exactly. me. Exactly. So with uh, somebody, maybe even a big star, you don't have to name or anything, but what is something that happens a lot in wrestling now that still bugs you? that you can see everyone making the same mistake, or most people at least? Mm. God, almost everything bugs me. <laughs> because there's, there's, really, there's really no... There's no the, you got to be a character. If you're a character, you don't have to do anything. You're a character. I don't want to see Jimmy Valiant wrestle. I want to see a care. I want to see Mag Dog Vachon rip somebody's nose off and bite their ear. Take his fucking teeth out and fucking hit him and squeeze him in the balls with it or something. He yeah he, he's a character. Now they have to they have to get all their spots in. 
you know, and spots aren't bad, but watch the other matches and don't do what they did. It's pretty simple. We destroyed the wrestling business by overthinking. I um this is just this is a uh, uh, someone who has never wrestled. Okay. I, I sort of notice a, uh, I've noticed a few things is when um Irish whips bug me. They never used to, but now they do because ever since YouTube became a thing, I wa- and even beforehand, I watched a lot of World of Sport British wrestling. Okay. And Irish whips in American style and British style are so different. In British style, if you whip someone into the ropes, you do it with two hands and you're right next to the ropes, so therefore there's logic in bouncing off the ropes and coming back again. Or you're okay. running across the uh, ring and taking six or seven steps to do it. Okay, now the secrets to an Irish whip. A, if you twist the guy's arm first, now, and if you pull with one finger, it's killing you and you have to go. You always go past the halfway mark. If it's a, It doesn't matter if it's a 24-foot ring or a 16, or a 14 from a special one in England. It doesn't matter. You're going past. And if you can let the, go from the guy four feet from the turnbuckle, wow. Mm. And the guy just sells. Now, if you're pulling him, and they've got their, and you've got his arm twisted, and you're lifting up on the elbow, ooh, one finger on the elbow, and you, oh, I'll do anything you want. So there's all these old tricks but you do them in a working way. And if a guy, a guy says, oh, you can't do that. I said, oh, you can't. Ah! Yes, you can do it mm. because I'm hurting you because I learned the old secrets from the old guys. I've seen on But TV. yes, there's nothing worse than, yeah, there's nothing worse than shitty turnbuckles and guys taking <laughs> the little steps <laughs> to do that. But, and just like we kill our own business, and guys don't even think about they're just thinking about their next spot. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you a couple more, and then we're going to take a quick break. You won't notice it. I'll just pause. But uh, right, so let me see. Uh, yes, Sunview, how did Rip get the opportunity to wrestle for Catch Wrestling Association in 1992? What did he think of the promoter Otto Vance and wrestling the likes of Dave Taylor, Steve Regal, Franz Schumann, and the late Larry Car- Cameron? Hey, this is... I won't remember all that stuff, but uh, this was great. The the year before, Otto contacted me about bringing me in as like a light heavyweight champion or whatever it was. I can't remember what town it was or whatever, but I had to do something and I couldn't go. So the next year, he just got a hold of me about working the whole thing. So I showed up and we started out in... Uh, in Vienna first, uh, we was at Graz, Seaboden, and then we were in uh, Vienna for six weeks. Then we changed to uh, Hano- We went to Hanover and Bremen, and Dort- when Dortmund was canceled, I went to England to work for uh, All Star Wrestling and Brian Dixon. Mm-hmm. So, but when I'm in Germany, there's fit. There's Dave Taylor and me and Regal stayed together in the caravans <laughs> or in the motel, wherever it was. So now I'm bonding with these guys and I'm going to go back and forth here because oh, please. that's the way I am. So when I got back to, uh, I got back to Atlanta, I'm telling Ole Anderson, I said, Ole, there's this guy fit Finley. I think he's the best heel I've ever seen. He goes, yeah. How tall is he? I said, I don't know how tall he is. I really, I was mesmerized. I didn't give a shit how tall he was. And I'm in the wrestling business and I was excited. He said, uh, eh. but anyway, <laughs> but the, the, the good thing about this is I got Regal a job, wrote his letter for him, send to Bill Watts, Max Payne a job. We all ran together, Daryl Peterson, who was an NCAA All-American. So I, I told him what to write for Bill Watts. So them two guys got jobs. Now, when they got jobs, once Lord Regal got in, he got fit in. He got Dave Taylor in. So they had great runs. 
So basically, none of you never seen those guys. If I wouldn't have hooked up with Regal and and did whatever. So what you do is when you see talent, you try and get them seen on a worldwide stage or whatever, so that if they hit it big time, they'll remember you helping them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, but when we worked for Dixon, I mean, I just stayed at Regal's house. I, I want to ask. I want to ask you this very. Uh, uh, just pick up on something you said before. You said you were mesmerized by Fit Finley. What, yes. You said it was the greatest heel you ever saw. Yes. Break break it down for me. Why? What is it about Fit? He 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 had the air about him, and he was like a legend there already. And then Tony St. Clair was there too. Mm -hmm. Uh. And uh, but but on Fit. We would go out at night, and I didn't drink. And let's say Fit could drink all day. <laughs> <laughs> all the English boys could, oh. you know. And he, he, when he was at the bars, because like if we were in, when we were in Hanover, we were there 10 straight weeks, 70 days. So all the boys are going to the same bar every night. And I'm going with him because I ain't got nothing to do because I've already trained five hours that day. I'm sick of training, <laughs> you know. So I'm just hanging out. When Finley, he said, you tell me when you got to go to the bathroom because the place would just be packed in there. I said, Fit, I got to go pee. He'd get up and he'd walk. And it was like the parting of the Red Seas. Every mark in there knew who he was. And he would just strut through there. He'd say, keep up with me. I'm basically <laughs> holding his hand to get through there, right? And then I remember somebody would say somebody tried to thank his hand and he just, let's just say the guy's thumb wasn't straight anymore. <laughs> oh no. Right. Fit was, uh, yeah. And whenever the cops would come around, well, well that's just fit. Stay away from him. <laughs> somebody had to go to the bathroom. Don't confront him or whatever. Fit was just, uh, but then, but then I, I heard fit got saved and he became real nice. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but those stories aren't as interesting, right? They're, they're, they're not. <laughs> but when I work with Fit, uh, now when I'm over there, I went over there as a baby or as a heel, and uh, I went to Austria first, where Peter William he ran Austria, and then Otto ran uh, he ran Germany. So I'm down there, and he said, "Hey, we got too many heels. Can you work babyface?" I said, "Sure, I'll do a puff gimmick." I worked a lot with Adrian Straight. I'll just copy him, right? So I did the, the, the Adrian Street copy the first night because he says, oh, you do that every night. And I said, what? I said, I'm a heel. He says, no, you're a baby face now. I said, well, I'm not any good at it, but I'll do the best I can. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we did that. And then I did that over in uh, working for Baba because they beat me and Danny Spivey half to death on TV. Hara and Tenru. Oh, my God. They were killing us. Danny Spivey and Danny Spivey is a real tough guy. Mm. And he didn't know what to do because they were like shooting. And he's trying, it was his first time there. He's trying to get along. So, uh, after the first night of TV, I went right into mode, into character, right? <laughs> Joe Higuchi, the ref started laughing and them got on all the Japanese guys, they were scared because I was doing everything and touching their, going up their arm and threatening to grab the worm and kiss them and everything. And they was just having to fit like they were scared and they didn't know what to do. So after that, Joe Higuchi said, Baba San said, you do that every night. I said, I got it. So I, I didn't want to get in there with them other Japanese did. Well, they worked so hard, beat the shit out of you. Now all of a sudden, I'm leading them, and they don't want to do nothing because they don't want to get me upset because I might grab their bollocks or something. <laughs> okay, so such as that. Anyway, now we're back. But now we're back in Germany, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll ask something <laughs> completely different. I'll ask something completely different. I'm going to move you on. I'm going to move you on. Um, oh, I got so much stuff about oh, Raymond I, and uh, Hanover. Do you know you should have a podcast to get all these stories out, Rip? Well, we try to get them in on uh, wrestling with Robert Rip Rogers, and you can. Uh, uh, subscribe on YouTube right now. You can do that. There you go. See, see, I'm not, okay. I'm not an amateur. I can get these plugs you're in. A, let me tell you're you. A, you're a professional, love. Of course, of course, I am. Of course. Oh, I'm. but uh, you're like this. The first time I was worked with Fit. Oh, go on. Okay. He he destroys me in three rounds. Right? Didn't give me nothing. And I'm because because he's wanting to feel me out. Right? 
to see if I was an American prick or whatever, right? <laughs> so I just work, go along with the flow. It was just all, and I just sold. And all of a sudden, I'm getting up, trying to pull myself the rope, and I fall down. And Fit comes over and looks at me like he's going to kill me again. I said, I think you gave me too much love. <laughs> and he just went, oh! And he sort of like broke character. And it was he just then it was great. After that, whenever I'd work with him, he'd give me a whole lot. Because I didn't hey, win, lose, or draw, pays the same. Don't give a rat's ass. Just put me in the game, coach. I, I don't care what it is. I, put I, me in the game. I want to play. I always love the stories like Regal or Dave Taylor or whoever else from England. They say, Oh, a fan would come up to them and say, Man, you're great. You you're the best wrestler in the world. And they always go, No. Fit Finley's the best wrestler yeah. in the world. Uh -huh. They everyone knows to tip the cap to Fit. Yeah, no, no, yeah, Fit's the man. That's all there is to it. That's like Dave Taylor. His grandpa was in the 1936 Olympics. Oh, really? As a wrestler. Then in 1940 and 44, they didn't have it because of uh of the, the war. World War II. Yeah. But all of a sudden, 1948 comes around, and there's and there's Dave Taylor's grandpa again on the Olympic team as a wrestler. Wow. So, yeah. That's the How same reason was... Stu Hart wasn't in the Olympics, I believe, as well, because of the war. Probably. Yeah. Because it all it all shut down in 40 and, uh, and 44. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, the last one was Berlin 36, which was a... Anyway, yes. I won't Jesse, get, I, the, the Jesse Owens one, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, oh, the, the whole, the old <laughs> story of that Hitler uh, treated Jesse Owens better than the Americans did when he got back. Anyway, that's another story for oh, another yeah. time. Another story for another time. I'm going to ask one more question, then I'll give you a little break. Um, you're in WCW. I don't need no break. You just, no, why don't you just say you got to pee or you need a yeah, break? Yeah, I need a giant piss. Uh, so okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go for a piss. A little a gypsy, gypsy kiss to piss. Okay. <laughs> we, see, we call it like a Jimmy Riddle or something like that. I'm trying to think of other slang or uh, slash. Yeah. Stuff like that. But a uh, 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 transatlantic I, I, one I used piss. To I used to have the, the book of Cockney slang in my library at home and somebody stole it. It was probably a Cockney. It would have to be, yeah. <laughs> I will. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question. Jim heard stories. You were in WCW on and off for a good few years, yeah. mostly through the Jim Heard reign of terror. Any personal stories with Jim or how he uh, treated you? He wouldn't have known who I was. I was running some developmental towns for him, but I don't think he knew who I was. I don't think he knew anything about wrestling. I don't think he cared to know anything about wrestling. And he just and he got Ole where Ole didn't give anything about wrestling because Heard had the ding dongs and some other tag. He just wanted to make stuff up to show that he was the boss. Mm. And Ole had to do what what he wanted, no matter what. So Ole just sort of, eh, well, whatever, it, whatever's it's okay because Heard determines everything. So we had a guy that was a lawyer. I think it was Kip Fry, mm -hmm. and I remember him saying, "Did you see me on TV?" I went, oh, no, another Mark as a boss. So we're answering to them, and they don't know anything about wrestling. So what What can you say? That'd be like me running for president or whatever, right? Yeah. Here well, I am a total you, you ran through uh, all four then. So you ran through Jim Hurd. You ran through yes. Kip Fry, Bill Watts, yes. and Eric Bischoff. Uh, of yes. the four, obviously Jim Hurd's not going to be your favorite, neither is Kip. But of the latter two, uh, what were their differences in their managerial style of uh, running the business? Well, when, when I worked for Eric, uh, he got rid of the developmental towns where I was making a lot of money. I was running shows, you know, I, you know, I might run four days in a row because they had a bunch of guys signed and they wanted them to be active. And some of my developmental towns had a higher profit margin than the big towns. But Eric, Eric said he would rather run the Astrodome and lose a quarter of a million dollars and to put up posters with uh, guys that are on the Superstation promo and wrestling in a small town. Hmm. So then, then again, if it was your money and you were making uh, showing a profit with the small towns, you'd run small towns because hmm. I know how to do that with ICW because I've been there, done that. So, and then we, oh, I love I love Bill Watts. I love working for Bill Watts, and I love working for Ole Anderson. All they were was the, most of the guys in the wrestling business were all missing a card. We're all out there. We don't want to ha have a real job. We get on TV. We think we're over. We're not. <laughs> we think we're somebody special. We're not. 
We're just kids that didn't grow up and I don't want to grow up. I'm 69 now and I still want to be in the wrestling business and have a good time because it's the world's greatest and worst business in the world because I've seen a, uh, a lot of the guys that I'd been with, they committed suicide because you couldn't go from the high to the lows. Hmm. And, it, and I call it the world's greatest, worst business. But this is a business I chose to be in. It's the only business I ever really wanted to be in. If you were in longer than me, I respect you so much. And today's product, I can't watch it because it makes me sad. It's the shits. Most of the promoters are just marks with a tax check or whatever. Kids today, they think they know it. They're stupid. But uh, then again, we're catering to kids on TV. It's not like we're connect we're not not guys critiquing matches. They're catering to kids. So it basically be just take your money and run. But I take it personal. But the audience is personal. so skews so old. It's like I think NXT now, like the audience is over fifty, like average. Oh really? Yeah, the audience is at ages like back in the WWF Attitude era when I watched it. The average age uh -huh. was in the twenties. Or right. somewhere around that. But now, the average age is around 50. So I don't even well, you, know why they're catering to kids, because kids don't watch it. Yeah, you, well, they used to have, like, you know, Saturday morning stuff. A lot of the TV markets Saturday morning would be in the local markets. But now all the but now they're on late at night, aren't they? Mm. So they, they can't really cater to kids. I, but I, last week on, on AEW, I watched the, the Four Pillars, and I just, like, barfed. The Four Pillars of AEW, I, I couldn't take it. Tell me, tell me about it. Why? I, I didn't. No, uh, I, I, oh, no. They look like they look like high school kids, and skinny fat, and no, no. They just look like it, it was embarrassing. Hmm. It was embarrassing to me, but you got to remember, I've been at this forty five years or so, so I look at it as different. Hmm. You know, it's like if I, if I was a young guy. Oh yeah, that was great. No, they're cool. They do cool moves. Oh, they do a lot of false finishes. Oh, they had eight dives in that one match. Oh, isn't that great? Yeah, that was the first match on the program, you know. Now what do we do? <laughs> but anyway, what was the next question? Uh, well, before we ask the next question, we're going to have a brief pause back in a sec. Okay, we had a little break and we're back on. I know it seemed like no break to you at all whatsoever, but uh, there was. Anyway, we're going to do a little game now, Rip. Uh, name association. I'm going to give you a sentence. You give me the first name. That okay. It comes to your mind when I give you this sentence. The first one is the funniest person in the locker room. And it can be any locker room. Brad Armstrong. Everyone says Brad. Go on, why Brad? Really? Everyone really? says Brad, yeah, yeah. Wow. He's one of, I had the best first match I ever had with anybody in my life with Brad Armstrong. Mm -hmm. He was so good. And I was testing him with everything. And he just, no matter what, he we had lock up. He would not get a hold. He would not do one move unless I told him to, which is the way it's supposed to be. In a, He just stayed in a fighting stance threatening. We could have threatened for an hour and a half, and he just stayed right there in shoot position, legs like the way you're supposed to be ready to fight, and he wouldn't say a word. No false finishes in the match. Beat me with the Russian leg sweep. Just fucking laugh. I said, Brad, I tried everything to mess you up out there just to get you smiling or laughing or whatever, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. He was so good. Greatest first match I ever had with anybody in the ring. He was just so, so talented. The next one is the, uh, well, cause you're not a drinker. So maybe I shouldn't ask for the last man. No, you standing, can ask. Last man standing at the bar. Oh, uh, we, uh, I, I wouldn't have any. No, I, I, have any I know. Idea. That yeah, have I wouldn't bad. have any idea. Yeah. Um, the most beautiful woman wrestler slash valet in real life. Hmm. Wow. With me, I've had them all a hundred times in my mind at night. Mm -hmm. with, and my right hand's on fire. <laughs> all I got to do is I got a, got a bottle of, lo got a bottle of uh, lotion, 10 seconds in the microwave and, 
Uh, and I, I just, you know, you know how you're flipping in this one and flipping in that one and flipping in this one. And I go, I go through, I go through twenty of the twenty of the of the hot divas the way it is. So the roll, as long the roll as, you know, uh, Yeah, as long as they don't have fat, you know, as long as they don't have hairy fingers, mm -hmm. you know, short stubby fingers and a fat thing or whatever. But anyway, but I'll just say all of them. That's fine. Uh, what's the old saying? Eighteen to eighty, blind, crippled, crazy. If they can't walk, uh, drag uh, them. Six to sixty, blind, crippled, or crazy. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, biggest bully. Wow. I think to me it was Adrian Adonis. To me it was, but mm -hmm. that could have been he was just picking on me. But to to be in the ring, he he was with me. Mm. So that's all I can go by. The smelliest wrestler. Wow. Mike Shaw was pretty good because he was he was he was real heavy, and a lot of times we'd be on the road and stuff, and then he'd just throw that stuff in that bag, right? Mm. And everybody, especially in the summertime, and then you had those big fat knee pads, and your knee, and it would really stink. So I, I'd always take uh, brute deodorant or or whatever and, and just, just spray my stuff. <laughs> like in Puerto Rico, you could hand wash everything at night, put it outside your window, and, and everything's cool. But yeah, my, Mike was yeah, Mike was pretty good. <laughs> Give <laughs> a little little sniff test. Do you know? Never had that name. After seventy times of asking, I've never had Mike Shaw, which sounds so strange because he was the Bastion Booger or something like yeah. that, wasn't he on WWF? Uh, uh, next one is biggest, and I don't know if you've got an answer for this. If you don't, just move on. Uh, okay. Biggest stooge for the dirt sheets. Wow. I really didn't pay attention to the dirt sheets, but, uh, and then Brian Alvarez, he uh, uh, is in the, the dirt sheet business with Dave Meltzer. Mm -hmm. And with Brian, Al you'll like this thing with Brian Alvarez. With Brian Alvarez, when I teach guys, I teach you to call it in a ring. So there's this guy, Ted the Trailer McNaylor. He, he had uh, Brian Alvarez come in to OBW. And the first time they wrestled, they'd ever seen anybody, they'd seen their, each other in their life, they went an hour. <laughs> because that's how good man beast, because that's how good all my guys were. They were, it was called, no, we chained for an hour every day. Every day. And then you, you'd, sometimes you'd be a guy, sometimes you a girl, sometimes the girl, I said, the girl, you weigh 200, you're working with a guy, but he weighs 160, you're reversing roles. So you had to learn to work baby face and learn, work to heel, and you learned to work with the size differential. When did I was out there. I did, was different. When did Brian come into OVW? Because I, I believe that he mostly stayed with, uh, you know, the Washington, yeah, he just Oregon Yeah, well, he just come in uh, to visit. Was what he did. Was Buddy Wayne come in too? Mm. Uh, he come in. Uh, this is Nick Wayne's dad. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, that was God. That was so. That was so many years ago. About oh nine or something like that. Mm. Uh, but and then because Buddy trained like I did, I said, "Well, hell, this will be great. All he's got to do is sit there and listen." And they did, and they had a great match. Now, uh, and I listen to Brian sometimes with Meltzer's. Now, Brian's had was actually trained, so he's got to step up on Meltzer. He was actually had matches, so he's got another step up on there. I can't respect you unless you're a wrestler because you don't know until you get in there and do it. Am I going to be a newspaper writer and talk about LeBron James or Michael? <laughs> and if I haven't played at that level. I can't do it. You can't imagine. And my opinion means nothing. So if you ain't a pro at what you're doing, basically shut the, shut the poop up. No, sorry. It's shut the, the poop the, up. It don't the, mean The occasional anything. F word is, is just fine. Don't okay. Worry. But shut the poop up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. The most dangerous situation you ever found yourself in? Uh... I got knifed in South Africa. Oh, did you really? Yes, actual, I guess. Actual yeah, knifed. I just, I just got slashed. But I guess that was pretty cool. That was I, I was working with Tiger Jeet Singh, 
the original Tiger Jeet Singh, and this was 19, this is when they still had an ar apartheid. So this was 1980, 80, 1987 when I, when I was there. And I worked with Tiger every night. And uh, so all the, it would be all pretty much all Indian uh, fans there, right? So as soon as Tiger, if he'd roll the ring, they'd just start throwing chairs in the ring. If I go out after him, they're after they're trying to get me. So I'm so and he's laughing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then we're working. Let's see, we worked three weeks in a row in Durban and had three riots. Uh, it was uh, it was pretty. It, it was different. Put it that way. You earned your money. Uh, you, you, yeah, you earned your money. And then Tiger was just putting me through the paces. And and the promoters were they they were marks. It was uh, Ajit Mahara and Ray Harry Passad. You can never forget those names. <laughs> and I was busy hitting on Tia, this black maid, and I, I was trying to trying to hit it, right? And she said, well, uh, you can't. If, 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 I, uh, if I'm with you, they will stone me. I said, what? No, a black is not allowed to be with a white. I said, and they will stone me to death. I said, well, hell, I want to do you to you, but not that mad. You just go out and we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so that was that. But I got slashed with a knife just a little bit and it was nice and bloody. And I had a, a scar here, but it, but it didn't really go in because I could see it coming, you know? Mm. So I guess that was, that was pretty exciting. And I remember they were throwing, we had the militia in there and me and Mike and Mike Doggendorf from ICW, he was there. And I said, I said, dog, uh, don't walk in front of the lights because uh, the cops said they all got guns and shit. <laughs> he said, oh, OK. So uh, so that I guess that was pretty exciting. Yeah, that's, that's a better answer than most people give me for that answer as well. Yeah, I got okay. knifed and, and, and uh, I yeah, could have got and stoned when, to and, when, and, you, and when you could remember Ray Harry Passat and Ajit Mahara, I remember Tiger, he worked having a fight with me in the, in the office. And here's a. Uh, uh, Ray Harry Passad, he's got the broken boxer's nose like Elton Owen, and he's got this gun out and he's shaking it like this. I'm and I'm giving fucking uh, oh, excuse me, no, don't uh, worry. I'm giving Tiger, Tiger, the, the Iggy, the, the, the hey, drop it, okay? <laughs> he said, they're shaking with that gun. I'm going, and I, and I remember, and I'm saying, oh, well, I remember thinking, what a place to die, Stanger, South <laughs> Africa. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that was theory. a pretty exciting story. What next the hell, right? Next question. Stiffest slash most reckless in the ring. Wow. Now, when I started, uh, I was so rotten. So I had to be the stiffest guy. I remember when I was working uh, for Sam Muchnick in wrestling at the chase, I worked with Flair, One Tape, and Mulligan. Flair hit me, or no, no, excuse me, uh, Dick Murdoch. Dick Murdoch hit me so hard, I thought he broke my jaw. Now, looking back at it, I probably didn't know how to sell, and I was just rotten, and he was just doing this because I had to sell. <laughs> but I remember we was working in WCW, and I, I said, Dickie, in 1978, I, I worked for Bruiser and worked Danville, Illinois, drove all night, worked Kansas City TV, St. Joe TV, come back down, work with you and Flair uh, for, uh, for Muchnick at the wrestling from the chase. He goes, and I said, you about broke my jaw. He goes, I remember that. He said, you moved. And then he got me. Uh, and I said, <laughs> hey, I got bleach blonde hair now, hair down to here. Then I had a black Afro. He goes, yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, God, you're too much, Dickie. But I remember me and him worked one time in Dayton, Ohio, me and Dick Murdoch, and he was and he was supposed to give me a brain buster. And we had this match. We just walked and talked. He's laughing the whole time. I had we're having so much fun. He said, hoop on him. Well, he didn't say that, but you know how Dickie would talk. But he said, no, I'm small packaging you. I ain't beating you that way. He says, no, you're too good to beat that way. And I said, are you sure? He says, I'll take all the heat. Nobody said a word because it was Dick Murdoch. He was, he was so good. God, he was good. Do you know the next question was actually going to be smoothest worker, so that might be Dick Murdoch as well maybe? 
No, Brad Armstrong. Was, Brad Armstrong was, again was what was the smoothest worker I ever worked with. I will. Uh, I'll move on from that then. Uh, wow, I'm going to skip a couple of these now. Oh, now this one's a great one for you, especially okay. to answer the loudest spot caller. Well, back then, it usually wasn't done that way because the only the heel called the match. Now, like today, Cena's always yelling them out. <laughs> Baby faces, all right. And But we didn't have all those boom cameras, the sound things and whatever. But I would just could call it, and I'd do it stuff with just the Iggy. Like I might shoot you, I might shoot you in off a headlock, drop down. Which means you just go over me, hit the next rope, and turn around, and you just hit me with a tackle. And, and if I turn around, whatever we were doing, feed to it. You know what I mean? We didn't have to say anything because we knew how to work. Mm -hmm. And we could say one or two words. And then it's like I was taught basically in the ring, Randy Savage, he, we were working 40 minutes in the ring. When I was a baby face, when I was the uh, the inevitable Hercules from hard, <laughs> or I was a disco kid. And never in my life did I, did I, uh, he, he always called it in the ring. Then all of a sudden he had that match with Ricky Steamboat. Then all of a, I guess he obviously changed because I never in my life got in the ring with him where he didn't, uh, just call it in the ring. Now, now explain that for people. Cause some people may not know the Ricky Steamboat backstory on that. Okay. Well, first of all, they were in that world's greatest, uh, WrestleMania. What was the Hogan main event yeah, with three with Andre? Yeah, yeah. So, in other words, the main event had nothing to do with wrestling. Is who could get slammed, right? So Savage got to go on before them. You know he's going to steal the show with Steamboat, and the last match was going to be nothing but the emotion of the slam. So I guess he pretty much wrote everybody knows the story where he wrote it all out and gave it to steamboat and he had and they all had it memorized or whatever mm. but never in my life have i done that but but almost everybody does it now but when i teach guys i teach call it in the ring i said now if you get a job forget everything i told you and just do as they fucking tell you how, how can you i don't understand how someone can memorize a hundred different no movements. i, I, I could it. no that's no i could not do that so now, because what you're doing, instead of working and being a character, you're busy thinking, what is next? I have to do this and do that and then do this and take two steps over here and I slam you and I cover you, kick out. Of course, it's on 2.9. And I said, oh, my God, I can't believe you kicked out. What the fuck? I oh, know. We'll move on. Uh, best enhancement talent. Bob Cook was real good. Mm hmm now I'm not counting Barry Horowitz as his enhancement talent. Barry talent Barry Horowitz was just a good talent. You can't help it what uh where you're put at because you could be a main eventer for somebody and somebody else you're working underneath because of uh guys have points in the office mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And a lot of times when uh a lot of times they get on me because they said, uh, I had my hair cornrowed and stuff, you know, don't don't wear that no more. You look too much like a star. <laughs> And then they talk, and then they get on me. They say, "Well, you can't work with him because your body's too good." Oh, excuse me. All I'm doing is is having a good time. I don't care about putting anybody over. If you want to push me, that's your business. If you don't want to, who cares? I'm having fun being a wrestler. That's all I want to do is be a wrestler and have a good time because I love the wrestling business. And I can't get a, and and kids today, I can't get on. I can't get mad at them because they don't know. I can't get mad at them because they're they're not in the position to work every day. I can't get mad at them when when all they know is writing it down. Here's your script for a promo. Here's your script for a match. Where you're where we're doing ten promos in a row with against a different guy in different town for a different market. Where they're doing one on cable. I can't get mad at him. With uh, oh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned Barry Horowitz because I interviewed Barry Horowitz last week as well. So, okay, so that's a, a good little I'll shout see him. out. I'll, well, I'll see him in. I'll see him tomorrow. Oh, there you go. Well, he, he should remember me, but I always hate to say that they'll remember me and they'll probably just forget. Well, me. he's got a he's got a good he's got a good memory. Yeah, uh, unlike me. Uh, let me see. I'm going to ask uh, maybe a couple more, then we'll move on to some more fan questions. Uh, I'm going to skip that one, skip that one, skip that one. Best Ribber. 
Best ribber. Golly. Or maybe even the best rib you ever saw. Well, the best rib, now I'll throw a Dutch in here, and I said I heard, but, mm -hmm. they, but, but, but they talk about the infamous Mabel rib, which you could always hit the young guys with. You know what the Mabel rib is? Is this... I think I do, but you tell it, because I'll just ruin it. Okay, it'd be like there's some hot girl there, whatever, right? So you're going to take her back to some place to, to uh, make love with her or whatever, then all of a sudden somebody comes in with a shotgun and everything and you end up taking off running and that's and that's the Mabel rib. You think the husband's come home and he's got a and he's got a shotgun, he's gonna shoot you and kill you. It's it must have been an inside term to call Mabel Mabel. You know, in the right. who knows. But I but I heard this thing in in the in the seventies. Uh, so uh, what wh so whatever it was. Most legitimate tough badass. Everyone says haku, well, would, but... Well, who knows for real, right? Mm -hmm. I just know Kurt Angle won the Olympics. You can't get any... You know how tough Brock Lesnar is and what an athlete he is. He was so good from being NCAA champion. He, he, he was playing in NFL Europe for the Minnesota Vikings team that was in Europe, and he didn't play college football. But a lot of tight ends were basketball players, and they uh, uh, ended up playing in, in the NFL, but they didn't play college football either. But Brock, then then Brock Lesnar said, hey, I think I'm going to be UFC champion. So he did it. So what the hell, right? So what, a, what an athlete he is. God, he's just, he's just a freak. Let's talk about Brock actually just now. Um, he's, you know, I spoke to Kenny and of uh, other people associated with OVW at the time. And was Brock... Okay, right, this is what I've heard, is that Brock was easy to deal with if you were his coach. Otherwise, he was tough to deal with in OVW. Does that ring true? Uh, I can see that. I can see, I can see Brock doing anything like he... If you was coaching him in college or, or if you was co coaching him in MMA or whatever, that he would respect you for that and he would do exactly as you say. I can see that. But if somebody else is talking to you, basically, shut up. You're just a mark. I don't respect your opinion. You're just a goof. Uh, I understand all that because that's why I am. Uh, what was the, <laughs> what was the uh, process of sort of like starting Brock off in the business and training and was Shelton Benjamin brought in to tag with him from the off to help him out, basically? Or am I well, getting that wrong? Uh, Shelton was older than Brock, but he was the and he was graduate assistant at Minnesota when Brock. So he was out there uh, sparring and working out with Brock because he was the heavyweight two years before Brock got there in Minnesota. So Shelton was just great. He was one of the best talents. What a good attitude. And he, and he was lean, but he, he was a whole lot bigger than you thought he was. And he was so athletic, such a good guy, but you know, uh, that really has nothing to do with in wrestling. If somebody likes you, you're in, if somebody got a hard on for you, you're out mm -hmm. and there ain't many places to go anymore. And that's, and that's the way ha talent has nothing to do with it. Nothing. It, somebody likes you, you're in, somebody don't like you, you're out. Absolutely. Uh, the final one, most memorable backstage fight. Hmm. I'm just thinking the ones I was in. The rest of them, <laughs> the, the rest of them, I'd be trying to get the hell out of there. Well, you've been accused of being in quite a lot of them. <laughs> I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to see none of that shit. It was bad for business. I want to focus on my match. And if somebody else could do something, you're trying to pull somebody off. Now somebody could sucker you because they're their buddy or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going, no. I'd be almost like a bill. Here, let them fight it out. Who cares? Somebody come out of there a winner. I just, I'm just glad they didn't hit me because, hell, I'd have got destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> we are now going to ask some fan questions. OVW, and we actually got the most for OVW. Probably not surprised to know. Uh, first one, OV, sorry, Jamie Waldrop. Who was the guy who you trained who you thought would be a can't-miss prospect 
who was never heard from again. Well, that's a question that's like Matt Morgan was so good, but he killed himself because he, he was a giant but worked like a midget. He did too many things. Andre the Giant would only do a, a handful of things, but each one he could take a headlock and crush your head. If he got a hammer lock, he could break your arm. If you're a giant, you got to know how to work like a giant. And that's what guys don't, they don't understand today. If you're Mr. Universe and you're wanting to do spots and flying stuff, you're just stupid. Play to your strengths. But like Matt, and Matt was a great person. He was a great athlete. Uh, he was a basketball player at Chaminade when he was in college, which is out by, in Hawaii. And he was, and we had him on our show. And uh, but he did too much. He was trying to work. He, you don't need to show the office that you can do all this stuff. It does because if you're a giant and you do it, it don't mean anything. I want a giant to hit you. I want Big Show to hit you one time and carry you out. Or a big boot to carry you out. I don't want to show that you can arm drag and kip up and hit you with a flying head scissors and you're a giant. People go, huh? Well, he's stupid. Hell, he's got 22-inch biceps. You could crush a guy, and he's wanting to act like he's a little guy. So, uh, whatever the question was, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with Matt... Um, was uh -huh. someone telling him to sort of showcase all his moves or is this just no a young idea. man's mindset essentially it's probably a young man's mindset because he was a young man in the business he wasn't a big wrestling fan you copy what you see on TV just like Dewey did I, I was seeing Jimmy Valiant so I wanted to be Jimmy half Jimmy Valiant I wanted to be Dick the Bruiser or whoever I wanted to be because that's what I seen on TV because you're a kid, you're playing like you're Michael Jordan or you're LeBron James, and it's the same in it. It's the same in any sport. And you got to remember, everybody starts dreaming about what they want to do when they're when they're when they're kids, and when they grow up, they're oh, hey, now I'm finally getting in the ring. Now I can do all that stuff. Mm. But well, we don't want you to do that. The more stuff you do, the weaker you look. No, I can do all that. St I said, no, just don't do that, please. You'll show each other that. I don't have time to give you a crash lesson in pro wrestling psychology. You got to pay your dues to, to, to get it. It uh, takes a long, long, long time to, to understand it. A lot of stars don't ever in, understand it, but the money's there. So what the hell? There's, um, there's two questions here are quite similar. I'm going to read them both. So Jay McElfrish, do you think WWE effed up by putting Doug and Danny uh, together as the Bashams? If they would have kept Danny as a single and push damager gimmick, do you think he could have had a run at the top of the card? And now I'm going to sort of follow that up with, where the heck was it? Uh, this is more OVW changes uh, after John Laurinaitis took over as WWE uh, Talent Relations VP. Okay, as far as the Bashams, the Bashams were really, really good workers. They understood pro wrestling. But then they put Linda Miles with them. Mm -hmm. And Linda was probably six, one and a half legit. Then she'd wear them heels or whatever. So now all of a sudden she's taller than the Bashams. And they were young, jacked, could work. But it instead of them being tough guys, Looking like they were, uh, you know, if they had if they had the tats, the, the drug lore, or whatever, this tough ass guys from the street, then the audience is torn where they got this girl, and Linda was a good wrestler. She didn't like wrestling, but she could throw better punches than the guys. She was more athletic than than most of the guys, but the Bashams were a, a good tag team. And if they if they could have stayed on there five more years, they'd have, uh, they'd have been really, 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 really good. But you know, you you, you get brought up, and they look at you. And if uh, uh, Bret Hart started out as Cowboy Bret Hart, some guys get three or four characters. Some guys do something wrong or don't do nothing wrong, and they're let go. You just don't know, and you can get let go for no reason. Uh, jumping off from the Bashams thing, so it's, it's a famous story, I think Jim Cornette tells it best, is 
John Laurinaitis takes over or starts making more decisions in WWE, starts pushing more directives onto OVW that make no sense. Someone from creative or whoever says, uh, I don't know if it's Doug or Danny, makes him shave the head. Oh, we just wanted to see what he looked bald. You know, that oh, kind yeah, of that was uh, Yeah, that was, that was Doug. And then Jimmy got mad and said, well, if I'd have known that, we could have done some angle. He could have had a hair match made to, and, and hopefully draw some money with it, right? But instead, all of a sudden, this Doug just shows up. But then again, uh, WWE sent a check every week, so they mm-hmm. kept us in business and kept our pockets lined with gold for a while. So what the hell, right? When did WWE start interfering more and more in like day-to-day OVW operations? Do you remember? I don't really know. I just know I went there and trained guys every day. And uh, a lot of the guys, you th- a lot of the guys weren't very good, and they got called up. That might be like they were had a big guarantee, and they were getting paid that money to learn. Brock was making five thousand dollars a week to learn. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then some of the other guys. Uh, now, when we had OBW, we had all the contract guys, but I got 70, 70 guys jobs with WWE that come through the beginners program, like Santino, like JTG, like Mike Mondo, like Johnny Jeter, like Serena Deeb, uh, and all the, all the originals of, of, of Nick Densmore and Rob Conway and, and the bash, they were all OVW guys from the little building we had. So, but they, uh, a lot of the guys walked in JTG used to take a bus from Brooklyn uh to come in to come into class then he moved to obw but then he had about a he had a very good a lot of guys had good runs and they start out in beginners class but they weren't the chosen few they were the ones that i just i treated them all the same i treated them like dogs i was on their ass I, because i had to make them good and they're going to go into this if they get brought up they're going to be in with guys that are veterans and the veterans hate them because they might take their job that's like if you were a masked man, every masked man hates you. If you were a black guy, every black guy hates you. If you were a Puerto Rican or a German, no matter what you were, if you were a white meat baby face, there's only, they only carry so many tackles on the, on the NFL, so many quarterbacks on the team. And, and they wanted so many of, of each demographic was what they wanted. So I taught everybody I learned how to call it in the ring, work baby face, work heel. I talked to, taught the girls to work with guys. We're, and uh, okay, now you're bigger, you're smaller, which, which we covered that earlier. And uh, I took it upon myself to make everybody good. And I didn't, but I also knew that if somebody liked somebody else, they were in. And it helps to be married to somebody, somebody's brother, uh, a second or third generation wrestler, or 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 whatever. And such as uh, the politics of wrestling, which has always been there, or any job, it's the same Oh shit. Mm. No matter what it is, it's all who you know. Now, there was apparently a list internally in OVW. I don't know if uh, uh, it was just Jim who wrote it, or Danny Davis did, or you did, or maybe all three of you, where there was a list of best prospects in OVW to the worst prospects, let's say a list of 20 people or whatever, you'd send it to WWE and they say you want to get one, two, and three, let's say number one is Nick Dinsmore, whoever, and they would pick 18, 19, and 20 because right. they had the best bodies. Do you remember any, right. did you help with the lists or anything like that? No, uh, I would just tell Danny because I never, I didn't want to, I want to be, I wanted to be left alone so I could coach. And I never, and Dr. Tom was my, he was my, my boss. He, every day I would, uh, would you fax something? This is what we did. And I had everything laid out. He never told me one thing to do or what not to do. He just wanted guys good and could handle it. So that's all we did. And we, and Dr. Tom, Dr. Tom's a sweetheart and he's one of the best. So when it was me and Danny and Jimmy Cornette, uh, and Dr. Tom, we, we never had any problems with anything. Mm-hmm. I just did my job and shut up because I consider Jimmy Cornette, the smartest guy I've ever met in wrestling. As far as explaining stuff, uh, he's just, he's just awesome. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he'd be like Albert Einstein. He's the Albert Einstein of wrestling. 
And the Marks can't understand it. And when he would go off, he had a passion for this business. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which that's, you got to, to make it in this business, you got to be special. And to make it in this business and not to be six foot six and 300 pounds taking steroids, you got to be special. And to make it when you're not related to somebody, you don't know, really know anybody, you just, you just stick out. You know what I mean? Mm. But uh, time in OVW, loved every minute of it. It was very hard. Uh, and just because we made recommendations of who the best ones were, they don't care. <laughs> no, they don't give a shit. They got their money invested in Brock and Shelton and, uh, and Bautista and Mark and Jindrak. Rand. That was a name that I always thought a body and a good look. Yeah. He, Mark was a great athlete. And I remember he got in the ring one night, uh, he come home for something and, and I said, Mark, put wrestling boots on. He says, well, I'm just going to do a little bit of stuff. So he did a little bit of stuff and he, he didn't break his ankle. He sprained it so bad. It messed him up for months and months and months. So, uh, so that was that. So you, you just don't ever know how you're going to get hurt. I blew my quad out just getting up and my quad exploded. Did I go to the doctor? No, it's still, it's still exploded. So what, mm. you know, we're doing a, we're doing a phony wrestling. Man, me and Riggle were wrestling in England. I slipped, I slipped and I, all I did was get up and boom, I quiet. So you think you tore your quad love? Uh, I did, but, but then we went 40. I said, what are we going to do? I said, we'll just do some uh, song and dance. We'll just do some comedy, which was great. And now we got from here to there to quad and whatever. I, I don't know. But you got to remember, I'm half C now. <laughs> uh, well, there's an old saying, isn't there? You, you'll uh, tell me if I got it wrong. But you never learn to work until your work hurts. Isn't that right? I don't. I ever heard that one. Have I'm you never? Old. Well, I'm if sure not, I've heard I it somewhere. About it. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. You really know how to. You learn how to work when you work hurts. So you've got a limitation, right. and you have to work around that, and uh -huh. still entertain. Then, uh, then as a secret, if you hurt your right knee, you tie, you, uh, you tape your left one. Well, then the guy goes for the left leg. <laughs> yeah. No, but he knows it. You know what I mean? That way you're, it's protected. Mm. Okay. Anyway, get back, get back what you're doing. Okay. I messed everything oh, no, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry. We're all, all stories. Right. We're going to do some general questions and then we're going to get to the main events as it were. And then I will thank you for your time. I know you wanted to do like a Kenny Boland sort of like 19 hour yeah. stretch out mm -hmm. thing, but, uh, uh, hey, we still might get there. Who knows? Uh, where the heck was my questions? Uh, oh, here they are. I thought I'd uh, switch the page on you there. Okay, we're going to go general. We've already talked about AEW. We've talked about the dive tweet. So, this fella says, and you've just mentioned him before, but everybody loves a good Jim Cornette story. Gavin asks, an icon, Jim Cornette, what are your views on Corny? He is the, uh, as you said, the, the Albert Einstein of booking and wrestling psychology. Well... I think he's the best. Uh, I watched him have a baseball bat and break out a bunch of windows at the old <laughs> building. And it was, it was to a building next door. So it really wasn't like he was breaking our windows in. He just throws a little fit and in a couple minutes, he's fine, ready to get back to work, but he's got to have, got to have some kind of outlet. So, uh, if that's his thing, I'm like, you know, well, okay. I just stay out of his way. I'm afraid he might hit me because when he did, he's got, a, he's got a glare in his eyes. I said, man, I, Ooh, <laughs> he scared the <laughs> shit out of me. <laughs> I, you know, I, I wanted to ask someone else, and we didn't get to it. I think it was Damien Sandow, and mm -hmm. I'll ask you. The infamous day that Santino didn't register the boogeyman in a show and Jim Cornette threw a fit over that. What, what happened that day? I remember everybody talking about it, what it was going to be. But then I did my thing and left <laughs> because see, I live two and a half hours away. So I was driving two and a half hours to get there. I might be there five hours and then two and a half hours back. Then I had to go work at UPS that night to get insurance. Mm. So I wanted to get the hell out of there. So I didn't, did I see it? No. Heard all about it. Yeah. But what you hear with, especially with any wrestlers, 
this guy changes it, this guy changes it, this guy changes it, this guy changes it. By the time it's the other side of the room, it's completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And it didn't involve me anyway. So I didn't give a shit. I'm going to give you a completely different question then. Um, okay. So obviously, I suppose when John Laurinaitis starts taking over WWE as the talent relations VP, there are all of a sudden a lot more models coming in and a lot of them are getting sent to OVW to train. Uh, do you remember any any of these models, good, bad or indifferent, that stick out in your mind that you had to force to train? Like, wasn't there like one girl who tried to bounce off the ropes and fainted or something? I never, I never, I never heard that one. Oh, were they not given to you then? Yeah, they were given to me, but they couldn't do anything. <laughs> so a lot of times I would I would just have some guys, i say, Mondo, go work with these girls, teach them how to chain the best you can because they're like powder puffs. They're going to get hurt. They're not going to be used to it. They're probably going to be bitching because they're sore tomorrow. what they do? Well, I got in the ring, you know, I did a couple things, but if your body's not used to it, you're going to get sore no matter what. <laughs> so I'd have a guy like got. I'd have all the guys that were extremely safe working with them because I knew most of them were going to make it anyway, and they're never going to be workers. So uh, I'm just trying to, uh, did they work hard? Yes. Are they any good? No. Do what you No, but it, they're your girls. You hired them, whatever. I'm doing the best I can and, and just see what happens. Did any of the models like actually surprise you of being particularly adept? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, they weren't the real girl, girl wrestlers like Serena Deeb, like uh, Mickey James. They they was they was great wrestlers. Mm. They was they was trained like guys. When they started bringing the the models in and then the fluff girls, it was great for great for the eyes. You know, you might have to go in the bathroom for thirty seconds or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> but this or that, and think about whoever you want to on the way home. But uh, it was it wasn't it wasn't good when you had to train them. Uh, let me just see. I'm going to skip that one because I don't know why it's there. I'm going to skip this one. Um, do you know what? Let's just go to the end. Let's go to the big finale, and we'll take as much time as you want on it. Uh, call it the firing line. It's basically the same thing as before, but I'm going to give you the name of a wrestler, and you tell me basically what you think of them. Mm -hmm. I imagine for the most part you're going to say they're good, or at least there's going to be a funny story uh, behind uh -huh. the name. Okay. First one. I don't know what they were called in OVW, but I remember them as the Gemini Twins. You know the bald twins? The Gemini Twins? I don't know who that is. Oh, you get gonna... I'm going to have to Google this one second. Okay, we've established it's the Shane Twins, and you can't remember. We're going to move on. Um, someone asked for a fun story about Billy Jack Haynes. Okay, I knew Billy... I was in with Billy in uh, in Tampa, and he had broke in... Uh, with Don Owens there. He used to be a mark. Buddy Rose used to like spit at him and everything. And then Buddy or uh Billy, he was he was out there. I was scared to death of him. I remember I worked with him in Tampa and I had him press slam me and everything. I never had no troubles with him, but I was scared to death of him. And I didn't want him to I didn't want him to go after me. But uh uh he he was he was he was a good wrestler. He was jacked. He didn't have no trouble selling. Uh, so he's all right with me. Mm -hmm. Next one, Matt Bourne. Matthew H. Bourne. Oh my God. <laughs> See, Matt was a, uh, second generation wrestler and his dad was tough. Tony Bourne and tough. Tony was so cool. He had that big old head, double cauliflower ears. When he got in the ring with you, he didn't touch you unless he hit you with that gut punch. He hit you with that gut punch. He had knocked the snot out of you. And then Matt was just breaking in when I was there. And let's just say Matt got in. Uh, Matt pulled a lot of shenanigans. <laughs> so, but Matt Matt was a real. Tony was a character. Matt was a real character. And uh, I remember Tough Tony, he would me and buddy would go to a restaurant where tony would go a lot of times he'd buy our dinner and uh we'd go in there and the waitress uh, he'd say no that gentleman over there bought your dinner but he would just say thanks tony and that'd be it tony never want nothing back and matt was the guy i told you about when he just stretched me on the uh uh on the elton shoot thing where we could have played it out because he he was still half mark but uh matt had good runs everywhere uh 
and for Atlanta, for Watts, he was he was in a a, a, a click with DiBiase and and Duggan. Uh, Matt was for Louisiana, but Matt always. He always got into a little bit of trouble, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I used to do a podcast with Don Morocco, and Don loves everybody, uh-huh. except for two people, Ole Anderson and Matt Bourne. And the reason why he doesn't like Matt Bourne is because uh, apparently Don rented a rental car and Matt Bourne asked oh, to borrow gosh. it. Oh, my God. Totaled the shit out of it didn't, and uh, didn't even get the insurance. So from that, that moment, moment on, Don, uh, he made it onto Don's, uh, uh, you know, n- no good list. He was on the poop list. Mm. Yeah, I got you. Uh, with Matt as well, I'm going to harp on with Matt a bit more. One thing I keep, like, when I hear stories about Matt is just genuinely how tough he was. He was actually a scary, tough person who could really take on a lot of people, and his name doesn't really get brought up much as a, you know, in on the badass list, so to speak. When, when he was Big Josh in WCW, he had gotten a whole lot bigger. He was still a great worker. And we had some, we had some good matches, but he was always cool with me because I knew him, I knew his dad, and I knew him when he was in Portland. So he always treated me special. Yeah. So we had a good we had a good bond. So he no. was just mischievous. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very nice way of putting it. Uh, Sean O'Hare. He was a real tough guy. He was a badass. He looked great, and I'm scared of him. And and he didn't like he did really like authority, <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was sort of scared of him, because I just thought he was a loose cannon ready to go off. Did you have meet and his brother, could, uh, 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 Shane? Right? Is it Shane? The the, the Sh- Shan was it Shan? Yeah, Shan O'Hare. Yeah, he was he was like his brother was a I think he was like six four six five and just jacked, and uh, Shan was just the opposite. But I, yeah, I had him in class too. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, next one. We've already mentioned Junkyard Dog, but um, you wrestled him in WCW, didn't you? Like the later, like early nineties. Well, you? it's like it's like Dog. I tell you some Dog story. I met Dog when he was Leroy Rochester, working for Nick Goulas in in seventy eight, and then uh, he was God in Mid South. So he just drew so much money. But he was, and he was still very limited. But he had such good heels to work with. He was great. And then when he worked, uh, he left there and went to the big time. I had him in for some shows. I remember I wired him some. I wired him two hundred dollars up front. And Pez was supposed. Pez Watley was supposed to bring him bring him to town where he was working. And to get there, he said, "Oh, there's no dog." I said, "Well, dog got me." I just wrote off the 200 bucks. I said, he got me. I said, but he made me a lot of money in mid South. So what the hell? Mm. But, but I uh, worked a lot of matches with him. Uh, That's when Ole would call up and said, Hey, can you work with the dog for a week? Sure. Can Ole? He Mm. says, okay, you ain't got no complaints. Oh, hell no. He does the best he can. He's limited. I know what he can do. That's great. But what the hell? Uh, The next one's Ole Anderson. I'll probably skip Ole. We've talked about him. Mark Henry. Love Mark Henry. Love Mark Henry. He was in OVW when I was there. World's strongest man. I used to fuck with him, and he could have killed me. <laughs> he used to wear these big old red tennis shoes. I didn't think they had boots that big. But look at him. He's still making money, getting money, getting that check, getting that bag at AEW. The last time they were the last time they were in town in Indianapolis, he come saw me. We did a bunch of videos, got lots of pictures of me and him flipping the bird and whatever talking shit and telling stories. Love him to death. Always will. Mm. He plugged my book for what the hell, right? Book? Oh, it's, well, you need to plug the book. Oh, I just have to have a book with me right here. You can get it on Amazon. The book on pro wrestling. Lessons from Rip Rogers. Get it at Amazon right now. Right hey. now, baby. Amazon. Lessons from Rip Rogers. Hey, hey I just have to have a t-shirt with me right here. ProWrestlingTees.com. Right there. Plug in the, plug in the podcast. And get your ripped T-shirt from uh, ProWrestlingTees.com. Hey, don't that's get what you're here for. That's we've we've got to get the, we've got to get the news out there, man. We've got to get oh, the news out there. Oh hell yeah! Hey, before hell um, yeah. before I move off, uh, Mark Henry, I want to ask you this. Obviously, uh, you know, you sent a lot of people up to WWE that you trained. Maybe not quite as many as Kenny Boland, but 
<laughs> but um, also, uh, I'm sure most people watching this will know that a lot of people from the WWE, WWF, whatever year it was, also came down for either seasoning or to lose weight or, you know, to get ring shape after an injury. Who had who had the best attitude from the WWF down to OVW? Because I think Mark Henry had a good attitude. Know, like Big Show came down, other people yeah, like big, that. Yeah, Big Show had a good attitude. And uh, I remember he ate like 24 uh, tacos. And then I said, you're going to puke. So and to make a long story short, pretty soon he was puking. I said, I said you learn something? Yeah, I won't do that anymore. Uh, yeah. But all the guys, a, a lot of the guys that come down had really good attitudes. And they treated it as such because it, uh, they knew what they were supposed to do. And I said, look, boys, I'm just a stooge. So whatever you're supposed to do. And then if, uh, if they ask me what you did, I will tell them what you did so that if you show up late, yes, I will tell them you showed up late. I'm not a stooge. You're making your own, you're digging your own grave or, uh, or, or whatever. Just do what you're supposed to do. You're big boys. You're making a lot of money doing not so real pro wrestling, live the dream, have a good time. Mm -hmm. Next name is Buzz Sawyer. I worked with Buzz some, and I, as a talent, I loved Buzz. He was really good. <laughs> as a person, not so much. <laughs> but uh, he got a lot of money from uh, Terry Allen, I think it was. Magnum? Yeah. Uh, I think that's when Magnum told me he uh, uh, paid $25,000 to be trained. And <laughs> Buzz took the money and ran or whatever. Jeez. But such is life. Uh, but anyway, I never had no problems with Buzz. He was a great athlete and a great worker. And Ole Anderson loved him to death. Mm. And usually what, what Ole, what I pretty much agreed with everything what Ole said. Now, when, 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 when say, oh, no, well, he said the Undertaker wasn't going to draw a dime. Well, he wasn't going to draw a dime as, as that character. But only Vince McMahon could have the vision to create the Undertaker. You know what I mean? Uh, Ole did stuff the hard way, the old way. But Ole, years ago, at one time, he was booking Charlotte that ran three towns a night, and he was booking Atlanta. He was doing it all. And Ole, he could sit there and be bullshit, and he could tell you six or seven things wrong this guy did. And, and Ole, the only problem was he wouldn't lie to you. If you were lazy and fat, he'd tell you you're lazy and fat. If he said you knew to do this in your matches, I, I just want you to do it the way I want to. If not, I'll get somebody else the will. Because, excuse me, you do what your boss says in anything. You got to make the boss happy. You're getting a check. S something I've never asked before, uh, just speaking of checks there, was how good a payoff man was Oli? Uh... When we was in championship Georgia, wrestling from Georgia, it was horrible. Oh, really? Yeah, because he took that money that Vince bought him out when he took the time slot or whatever and was basically bankrolling it on that. But a, a lot of the TVs that he had had, we was on that. They put us on that shitty 7 o'clock in the morning time slot on Atlanta. And we had DiBiase. We had, we had some good talent, but all of a sudden, and in the other markets, we still ended up would go would be going on tour and stuff, but but it used to be all them tours w was good. Uh, uh, anything in Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, uh, Ohio, West Virginia, they were just big time crowds. And when we lost, we got that shitty slot on uh, TBS. It just knocked business in half. Mm -hmm. One time I said, "Oli, you're supposed to pay us today. When am I going to get my check?" He says. A uh, couple of days we're going on tour and then we'll have cash. <laughs> I said, in other words, you ain't paying us because you ain't got it. He said, yeah. I said, okay. I just wanted an answer. So, so that's okay. So, uh, and when I was with, I was working for Ron Fuller. Ole called me on the phone. He said, uh, uh, Bob Armstrong just called me. He said, the road warriors are going to the AWA. They want to wrestle there because that's where, where they were from and be working in their home territory. He said, can you come in and work with this guy called Ted Oates? I want to make you the Hollywood blondes. 
And I said, well, they just had Jerry Brown as a Hollywood blonde with Buddy Roberts, right? So then, but I said, oh, sure, that's fine. He says, I want to give you, tra make you transition tag team. Can you do that? I said, yeah. We didn't talk money or anything. I was just looking at the exposure, a chance to do something else. So me and Ted Oates were uh, national tag team champions for a while. And then later on, I broke off and worked a big angle, a long program with Tommy Rich. And then Crockett brought in. And as soon as Dusty come in, I was gone. So I went down and worked for Wahoo. So things just happen in wrestling. Where were you during uh, Black Saturday and that whole process of the Briscoes and everyone else selling their shares to Vince? We were, we were on tour. Oh, wait a minute. No, no. I was thinking of the thing when... Uh, uh, John Stossel got slapped. That wasn't a black set. I was working for Fuller. So what was but, that about? Uh, yeah, like mid eighty four, I think. Yeah, uh, but it was Bob Armstrong. He said Bob Armstrong said you could do anything. So can you be a, a, a heel tag team with the bleach blonde hair? So I want to get away from the road wars and do just the opposite. Can you give me the old blonde haired chicken shit? I sure, I sure as hell can, <laughs> and I can do it real well too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a few more names. I'll thank you. For, well, I've got loads of names, but we'll see how many we get through. Uh, Austin Idol. Austin Idol. I really learned to work from Austin Idol. Great promos, great body in the ring. I worked 10 weeks in a row with him for Fuller and didn't really like to do jobs. Uh, but what Babyface does. Mm -hmm. uh, but he could really, as soon as he started wrestling, the aura was gone. As long as he stayed in character and think of Jimmy Valiant, but built, could strut, had the fuck, was built, could talk. He was a star. Mm -hmm. He knew how to be a star. He knew how to work his gimmick, and I followed his lead and would only do things to make him look great. Always got along with him, and he and he could usually uh, uh, go to Memphis, work there for months and months and months, go to Atlanta, maybe go to Charlotte, go to Tampa or whatever, but he was always usually where he was used to sunshine, baby. <laughs> well, you know, that's funny you mention that. So the story I always heard was that Austin Idol never made it big in like WCW or wherever it was because he just didn't like the travel. Right. Mm hmm. But just, I just, I, but I understand that. Was he just like homesick or did he not like flying or? Well, he was in that plane crash. Mm -hmm. Of course. As Iron Mike, yes. So I imagine he didn't want to fly the rest of his life. <laughs> well, uh, wasn't it the old joke that everyone wanted to fly with Ric Flair because what are the chances of a uh, plane crashing twice in one lifetime? Well, I heard that one. Yeah. But. Uh, okay, we'll move on. Um, Gypsy Joe. Gypsy Joe. I like Gypsy Joe. He was a tough guy. You could hit him, no matter how hard you hit him, he'd say, hit me harder. I said, Joe, why would I hit you harder? You're the no pain train. You ain't going to sell it anyway. So fuck you. I ain't going to hit you hard. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd chop the shit out of you, and he loved getting chopped back. He 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 was a tough guy. He was a good guy too. Yeah. The Road Warriors. Did you ever wrestle the Road war, war, uh, Road Warriors? They used to put me a lot on TV with them, and it always beat the other guy. I knew what they wanted, and I could do all their stuff. And I said, and I said, I told Hawk, I said, hey, I can get you guys shit over, and as long as you don't. They don't beat me. They beat my partner. I can, they'd always let me take a powder and powder out. You see what I mean? Yeah. So they had a good time. All right, we're with Rip. We can do all of our shit, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's sort of funny, but hey, you learn survival skills, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, earthquake. Uh, I don't know how many people know this. You wrestled against him in Japan, I think. Oh, yeah. I remember. Okay. Big John Tanta. He was a sumo guy. Mm -hmm. And he must have weighed legitimately about... 370 i'm thinking and i remember i called something and i'm coming off him 100 miles an hour from off the ropes and and i'm seeing looking his eyes with panic he's saying his eyes are saying what did you say all of a sudden as i'm i'm a half i'm a half step from him, i'm going hip toss 
So, boom, he gives me a judo throw. Boom. Right. <laughs> we just laughed about that. But he was he was a really good guy. Mm. Big John Tenta was. He wouldn't have heard a fly. Michael Hayes. I love Michael Hayes. Michael, I met Michael Hayes when he was in Nashville working for Nick when him and Terry came in. Now, Mike started when he was like 17, and Terry was, I think, 14. And uh, he gave me the number to the Calkins where they come in from, from Mississippi. So, uh, and George Calkin, George and Gil Calkin, they were the first guy that gave me the name Rip Rogers. Rip Rogers, who was, uh, who was Eddie Graham's name in Texas in 1955. I was the second Rip Rogers. But Mike Hayes, he was such an entertainer. What a great gig hat was guy to get those people wild up to be a heel. His work was rotten <laughs> as far as wrestling, but he knew how to get over, how to keep that team over. And when he was in the corner, you, he had more heat than anybody. And when he turned baby face, me and him worked in the Omni for Ole. And I was trying to do his moonwalk and he could turn off, turn from being the baby face, being the heel, either one. He was great at it. Mm -hmm. And he's had how long of a run in WWE since 95, I think. And, that and was when he end. was wrestling, he lasted about a month there, I'm thinking. <laughs> I don't even think he wrestled. Uh, I'm not I sure think, he ever wrestled I, on TV. Oh, I think I saw on. him. I think like, I think I saw him one time yeah. or whatever as the Freebirds, but it was it, to me it looked like oh. from TV it was, it was one and done. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so the Freebirds wrestled WWF for a few months but weren't really ever on TV. And then when Michael Hayes went in 95... He was okay. mostly a, a commentator, backstage guy, and then I think he did a few matches with like the Hardy Boys. I think. Okay. And uh, but it was so, it, it was funny how he was had been brought up NWA style, right? Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden he can convert and get a job and just completely go WWE, which is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. To me, it's mind boggling. You, you get you do that, you do it this way, you do it this way, you do it this way, and all of a sudden, oh. Oh, well, we're changing. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he, did, he got that check, and he's still getting that check. So what the heck? Good for him. But he, but he, but he was a great moonwalker, ladies and gentlemen. He had that. He had that great hair, mm -hmm. and he, and you, you could love him or hate him, but there was you're definitely gonna get a reaction. Yeah, the first time I saw Michael Hayes was when I watched Highlander because he's at the beginning. He's a, I don't know if you ever saw Highlander. No. no. He's in it anyway. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so is Greg Garnier somehow as well. Um, uh, Brian Pillman. Oh, Pillman was great. Uh, I had him in Calgary. Yeah. And then so, once so when I we we worked a three match format on TV, and we got heat, and uh, I still made all the TVs, but they was keep me all. I was punished, but I didn't find out to later that I got punished for having too good of a matches with Pillman. <laughs> no, that was, that right, was right. the thing. Uh, don't overstep, but all I want to do, like all the guys, they want to see him do it on, on video. Right. So you got it forever. Yeah. So he's clotheslining me off the balcony and shit. Right. We're just busting balls and he'd be there and he hated working with me. Cause I was a cardio King and he'd be taking that thing <gasps> to, to make you breathe good. Uh, uh, but he was, we had beat the shit out of each other, but he was so coordinated and he was years ahead of everybody. As far as this, the mind in the wrestling business, he was really, really good. I love work with Brian Pillman and I got to work with his, his son. And when he was around, he would come down and see me at OBW and he was a good kid, but I think he's under, I think he's working with AEW. Yep. He is. Yeah. But but Brian Pillman, he was he was a hell of a talent. Sting, I know you mentioned Sting before you wrestled him. Sting ended up being a good pro. Uh, he's got longevity. He always looked good. He had that ring with Luger. So and he's obviously did. What I hated was he wore pink. I was getting <laughs> I would get heat wearing pink, and then he's wearing pink as a baby face. Now you're, th you're throwing mixed signs to the fans, you know, and then he, when he would scream, he had that high voice, which was a no, no. 
and he was wearing pink, which is a no-no. But who gives a fuck what I think? He was blonde. But, he was blonde at the time as well. Yeah. Uh, well, but he, but he, I remember meeting him when he come into Lexington. It was him and the Ultimate Warrior was there when I was I was in there for Jared or something when they first come in and God they were fucking rotten but they sure as hell made a lot of money so that's all you can gauge it by uh so well he's had a great career there's no doubt about that so what the hell okay I'm gonna I'm gonna limit it to three more um the shock master now who's the shock master was that, was, that the guy that was Fred Ottman and, Fred he, Ottman. Fell th- and he fell through that's the wall. when he fell through the thing yeah yeah, that was when he fell through the thing. That was, uh, yeah, Fred wasn't very coordinated. He was a nice guy. Hell, he was huge. And he had that little head, so it made his arms look, <laughs> he, looked, he, looked like a, he looked like a cartoon character. He was a guy. He wasn't no high spot guy, as you can see, but he made a hell of a living, so what the hell, right? Uh, no, that was a high spot through the wall. It was oh. an amazing high spot. And then it was, and only he could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> two more then um i'm going to ask this is the penultimate one andre the giant okay i got to drive andre around a little bit when i was in nashville i picked him up at the airport i had a van and and it, all it had in it was a bunch of beer and a bunch of mattresses so he could lay in the back and i drove into some towns and everything mm-hmm. and then he was still calling me boss he called everybody boss you know and he rips some, and he rips some great farts. <laughs> so uh, that that was about it. Uh, uh, was taking him around to Nick Gulas' territory. I was low man on the totem pole, so I got to do that. When Mark Lewin comes to town, whatever, I get to pick him. I get to pick him up at the airport. My driving, driving my 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 five speed Pinto. Pick them up. It was a small car. If he was a big guy, he was in trouble. Uh, but anyway, I was low man to totem pole, so I had to do the shit job because I was a rotten worker. <laughs> and we're going to end on the very last one. We mentioned him before as well, but uh, you had a feud with him. You stole his gimmick, apparently in Germany. Exotic. Oh, Adrian. Adrian Street. Yeah. Adrian was a sweetheart. And Adrian, he was uh, such a hot heel there for Fuller's. Then they turned him babyface. So the very first night in, we, we go into a pull apart. And I work with him for six straight months. Every show, but I think about three, and they were spot shows. And it was me and my valet against him and his valet. We had mixed things, Texas tour. We had all kinds of stuff. Mm. But as soon as I finished up with him, I just left. Because I couldn't follow it. The matches were, it, it it was so good. It was the best program I ever had in my life. Fuller would let me, he had asked me for some ideas and he'd say, no, we did this seven years ago with this guy. He did this so many years, whatever this and that. So let's change, but let's change the order into this then lead into this because last time we did this. So let's show them different. Hmm. And okay. But, but Ron, would he let me lay it out that then he would change it. He was, but he would work with the guys. Hey, figure something out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'd figure something out. Then a lot of them he had changed, but I learned a whole lot working under Ron Fuller, all the Fullers. With um with Adrian, I've interviewed him. I'm sort of almost making it my mission to bring, you know, to promote Adrian as much as possible because as far as in-ring character presentation, right. and keep in mind, mm-hmm. he was five six, five foot six in America, where, like, the average yeah. was something like 6'1". No, 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 no. No, average American height's still the same. No, I mean, like, in You're- wrestling. Oh yeah, and wrestling, but yeah, Adrian had the gimmick boots on. I know. Well, that, I was actually going to say, like, he made himself like not with the boots, but he yeah. presented a tall, big figure. But but in he, he had that huge chest. He had a great physique, and it's like he said, when you're on your back and I'm on top, it doesn't matter how tall you are, mate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I never had no troubles with him because he completely respected me, and I completely respected him. And he told me when he was in America, that was the best feud he'd ever had in America. Not in Europe or anything, but just in America. Mm. He was just so talented, and he would and and he was the the king of the of the gimmick table. Oh yeah, of 
Oh yeah. He would paint guys faces for so much money. The fans, they would have all of them. He had so many different pictures and everything from different places. He made so much money. Then he would make, he'd call my valet who was my wife at that time. He'd call her flea bag. So he'd make up flea bag posters. He'd sell them at his table. Then he'd give me the money. Cause heels couldn't heels. didn't. he didn't, we didn't set, we didn't go to the gimmick table, you know, mm-hmm. baby faces. They wanted to be baby faces so they can make money, you know? So Adrian was just a dream to work with. He was a sweetheart. He's still 80 something kicking ass, living back home in the United Kingdom again, just a legend, uh, still plugging the dolls all the time. Of course. About oh. once a week. About got, once a week. I've got one behind like, me. Okay. We're liking something or uh, making a quote or whatever it was. Uh, just a great guy. And he got, and he did get the hell out of those mines and he made a good living. Yeah. Good. So God, God bless him and, and good for him. Yeah. Uh, who was tougher, him or Miss Linda? Well, Adrian always told me Miss Linda was. <laughs> and when usually when, when Adrian is a heel, he'd tell me the stories about them jumping on him and him trying to get them off of him. He said to the fans, or he said, you don't have to worry about me. You need to worry about her. So I was double scared against Linda. He could have been ribbing me, but I was scared. Yeah. I've, I've heard stories about, uh, obviously, you know, it was more prevalent that fans would try and run into the ring and she was like the greatest barrier. Like she would just happily take fans down and knock them out and stuff. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So, then, then was good working with Adrian Street was some, they, they were some great times. Yeah. I'm I'm that, happy you said that. And what a great that, story! That was that was nothing but fun. Yeah. Hey, let me, let me give this story right now. We oh, hadn't please. touched on. Uh, I was working for Wahoo, and uh, uh, Larry Fole come into Rick Poston's gym. Rick Poston, who was a uh, uh, one Mister America, his height class, and his his girl his wife at the time uh, was the world's strongest woman. Of course, she didn't have much hair because uh, because of steroids and stuff, but Lex Luger come in, Larry Fole come in. He asked me, he said, Mr. Rogers, how can I get in the wrestling business? He'd been playing with the USFL and they had basically went out of business. I said, you go down to the, uh, sportatorium in Tampa, 106 North Albany. You talk to hero Matsuda and I'm sure he'll take care of you. <laughs> That's what he did. And, uh, and the rest is history. Mm. Well, I was going to say a great story to end it on, but uh, another story. So you're, I don't know why, I think Lex Luger, at least his body of work should be like reevaluated because I don't think many people really appreciated him at the time. But especially his interviews, quite a lot of his interviews are really good. And I don't, I don't think he gets his due in that sense. Well, he, he looks so good and you actually thought he was really the narcissist. <laughs> Because he was always eyeballed himself, mirror shot himself, look at himself as sort of like posing, right? Mm. Which is what I did when I was in bodybuilding because I wanted to see if I was cut, if I was holding too much water. It wasn't, uh, I was a fat kid. So I'm sitting here thinking, I hope I, I hope my love handles ain't too big. I hope I'm not embarrassing anybody. So hell, when I was 40 years old, I was embarrassed and working in a t-shirt because I didn't look the way I used to. And the fans say, oh no, you look great. I'm sitting there. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Have oh, we was talking about you was talking about that story before about uh, you know, the paper. What, what was the pay per view that that uh, uh, it was the uh, the battle royal, whatever? And I was partners with uh, uh was it uh, 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 the, against, the battle I, bowl? Was it the battle bowl? Yeah. yeah. So I yeah I was I was supposed to be working fair show for Bobby Fulton. I used to work all Bobby Fulton's fair shows. And Dusty said, uh, but Dusty was a boss. He said, I want you to work this pay-per-view. I said, I can. I'm working one of Bobby Fulton's shows. So he told me, you work this pay-per-view, I'll, or I'll make sure you're blackballed. You'll never work for this company again. Yeah. So then Bobby got mad at me because I didn't make his show. And I said, well, you know, what What can I do? So so Bobby didn't usually know didn't usually for any fair shows. For a couple of years and before, I was on every one of them because they were all in Ohio and I lived in Indiana. So that's the wrestling business for you. It's, it's amazing how you're many damned threats. if you do and damned if you don't, right? It's, yeah, it's amazing how many threats of getting blackballed for working for ser- someone or not. It's like right. I mean, you were with the Poffo territory, I mean, that was an outlaw promotion. I mean, I thought mm-hmm. you must have been threatened with being blackballed for working there at one point. Well, I was so green, I didn't know what blackballed was, and I said, "Well, hell, nobody's used me but these people anyway. So who cares?" And as Gar- Garvin always told me, "Hey, if you can draw money 
and you're a pro, you can get work anywhere. Hmm. They, they watch you for a week and they go, hell, he's just like everybody else. <laughs> but he's a better worker than what we got. So just use him. So the black balls don't ever last. No. Uh, would you do a last match like Ric Flair? Or better than Ric Flair? Me? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm crippled. I can't do anything. Hips ain't mine. Knee ain't mine. Neuropathy in my feet. You name it. Hit and run left for dead years ago. All the above. Right. Hell, if I fall down, I couldn't get up. I couldn't get in the ring anyway. <laughs> but if I was in shape, would I have done it? You're damn right I would have. Mm. But it would have been, it wouldn't have been wrestling. It would have been character. We'd have two characters out there walking and talking, doing and nothing, threatening everything, an old style wrestling match. I wouldn't have blown up and and uh and that would have been it. I took the I took the boots off. I I never I never asked this and I don't know why, but what was your favorite match ever? It was the one that, you know, if you had to I don't know, play it you know, uh, uh, encapsulate everything you're about and you're just your favorite match. Oh, my favorite match with people, with different guys? With you, yeah. With you in it. Well, I don't know with me. I just know the best match I ever saw on TV that I got into was Ric Flair against Terry Funk in the I Quit match. Yeah. I quit. Hmm. I give up. <laughs> it was just, I just, I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it. Goosebumps thinking about that, and that was how many years ago? I never looked at myself as a great talent. I just went out there to do what I learned, to have the best matches I can. If you're the baby face, according to our position on the card and where you're used at on the card, like on television stuff, whether I need to take more or take less, I will never make you look bad. I will never sabotage you on purpose and be an asshole. I got too much respect for this business and what it was made of, and the guys that did it before us. Rip, um, we've been doing, God, two and a half hours now. I don't feel like I've picked one millionth of your brain with all the questions I've asked, but <laughs> I, I, I want to you know, I want to thank you for spending so much time with me. Uh, before we go, hit me with all the plugs one more time. Oh, plugs, okay. First of all, we got to go to Amazon right now. Get your book on pro wrestling, Lessons from Rip Rogers, Amazon.com. Hey, didn't you swing right over to ProWrestlingTees.com and get your uh, Wrestling with Rip Rogers t-shirt right here. Mm -hmm. Then after that, the most important thing is everybody watching this right now, subscribe. Go to YouTube and subscribe, please, to, what is it, Wrestling with Rip Rogers? I think that's what it is. Yep, yep. Yeah, I, yeah, I was just, I was just. It says it on the T-shirt from Pro Wrestling yeah. Tees. So yeah. if you're confused, but, buy the T-shirt and then read it and then yeah. subscribe. And then, but no, go right now. Everybody is listening to this, and even if you're not listening, do it anyway. Go to YouTube, subscribe, ladies and gentlemen, to Wrestling with Rip Rogers, and I appreciate it. Don't I, get any better than this, does it? I just also want to show that I've got the doll, the Adrian Street doll, right here. Oh, okay, beautiful. Yeah, and uh, I got. I think he signed it. I can't, what did he? Oh, it's autographed. They don't get yeah. any better than that. There you go. What Adrian, was, Adrian was always the first one there in any town to be in the first slot. The first person you saw as a fan was you're going to buy from Adrian. Mm. And he get and if you only had ten dollars, you give that ten to Adrian. Everybody else was shit out of luck. But he was going to be <laughs> first one there anyway. It didn't matter. <laughs> I never asked you this. Did you ever buy trunks off him? Or any wrestling no, game? Uh -uh. No. Uh, when I first started, you had all the Carl and Hildegard shit. The K and H it was what it was. And then I started getting, getting, uh, and then my wife made the pink trunks, made all my robes and shit. And then I started getting, we could get the bicycle pants that were pink. Uh, and so I just wore, you could just get them for $10 years ago, whatever, and they'd basically last a lifetime. Did you, um, do you know, I only heard this not too long ago, like to get wrestling boots custom, like you had to draw an outline of your own foot on a piece yes. of paper and send it and off. You would se and you would send them to B Bar A Boot Shop. It was Noel Ash in Paris, Arkansas. That was Bill Ash, who was a worker. That was his father. And they own, and I, and every pair of boots I ever got, except the first ones, which were the gimmick pairs you could get out of Carl and Hildegard. They were like boxing boots, really. 
they were all Noel Ash and boots. And he was the only ones I ever heard about making boots until they had, I think it was the Mexican boot place in Houston or something like that. But uh, all my boots was uh, no lash boots, B bar A or B slash whatever it was in and, Paris, Arkansas. And the one thing your boots never had was you never wore kick pads. No, I never wore kick pads. Now, my my uh, my knee pads would slip down sometime and fall down. I'd pull them some bitches back up. <laughs> yeah, if you had small cabs, you, uh, you wore the kick pads. Yeah. Right, uh, I'm going to shut it down. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. We'll be back whenever we're back. I mean, it, it seems to be quite random these days. There's always content on WSI, as you know. But for now, thank you very much for watching. Rip. Did, did I did I break Boland's record for uh, for being on here the longest? No, How no, long? you're 18 minutes shy, but I'm hungry. Oh, I'm 18 minutes shy, but yeah. you're over it. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. over it. I, I, it. To the point where I'm so hungry that I have to eat right now. <laughs> so. I'll end it, uh, hey, I could have told you that I could have the I could have told you the story about uh, uh, me not eating for 150 straight days, couldn't <laughs> I? <laughs> you could have done. No, it. Is shoot. It, is it an, is it an 18 and a half minute story? No, I can no, I can do it in uh, in one minute. Oh, okay, go on then. No, I I went from 232 to 169. I didn't. I had one every day. I had a glass of skim milk. I had a glass of orange juice, and I had a glass of chicken broth. After three days, there's no hunger at all. If you go to a bakery inside a McDonald's, any restaurant, you're not, you don't even want any food. Now I quit training except doing isometrics because I would, I wouldn't have been able to make it. I was going to say, but you, to mean, go you must hunt, be really tired. Hunt, no, your body adjusts 150 days in a row with no real food in you. And I was still shitting solid. That shows you what's inside of me. <laughs> hold it. Hold it. Now, what, now that's a way to end the program, ain't it? Yeah. Uh, and for all you people out there shitting solid, uh, continue to solidly shit. And let's see the biceps. Oh, excuse me. 69, 69 years old. That's Been the to the spirit. gym three hours already this morning. Such it is. And I'll do it till I croak. <laughs> so if I croak, I'll try and get that last workout in. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Rip, uh, say goodbye to the fans. Okay. Goodbye to the fans.